Well, hello, fellow humans. Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast where middle-aged guys talk about movies on the whole ding-dong internet. Glad you found us. What we do here is we take a theme, find six movies that represent that theme, and then we watch them and present them to you, our gracious listeners. To make it worth your while, we give you a little story about the movies up front, then we talk all about the movies themselves, and often use silly voices to make our case that these movies are frequently not very good. We're winding down season 11. We're all gonna die! Our penultimate episode is the second time someone tried to make a sequel to Terminator 2, Terminator Dark Fate. It has Sarah Connor and old Arnold and helicopters and explosions and one Terminator that can become two Terminators and... and it's just not very good. But let's get Chad in here to explain how all of this happened. Now why is all that loose paper blowing around? Why are there sparks everywhere? Oh no... All right, you ready to record? Okay, I'm ready. Maybe I should introduce you quickly so your mom and dad know you're really working for a uh, like a real podcast as an intern. Well, they they can't see or hear you. you hey, everybody! They, look, Brittany is here. She's with me. She's our intern this season, and I want to tell her mother and her father she's doing a great job recording and editing each show each week. So, hi to Brittany's mom and dad. You raised a wonderful daughter. What are what are their names? Ray and Diane. Hello, Ray and Diane in Wichita. You've raised a wonderful, smart daughter who's doing a great job working for Pick Six Movies. <clears throat> All right, let's record the intro for Terminator Dark Fate. And then you can work your magic on the editing a little later. Bum 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 bum. Bum 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 bum. Okay, here we go. Throughout much of human existence, three conflicts have faced humanity. Man versus animal, man versus man, and man versus himself. But somewhere along the path of human evolution, a fourth category of conflict emerged, man versus machine. Human history and accompanying world literature shows that machines really started out as tools to help humans do what we couldn't do all by ourselves, hammer a nail in a board, keep our food cool and prevent spoiling, change the TV channel without us getting up off of our asses from our Barca lounger. Sure, a lot of machines started out as rocks and stones, but soon we entered into the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, which allowed us to forge weapons and create a greater ability for human survival and competitive advantage against our enemies, which were mostly other humans. Man and machine worked hand in hand, a beautiful partnership where man was the dominant overlord and machines were our lowly servants. And as we all know, this relationship usually sours and things go sideways real fast especially for those in charge. In the late 1700s, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, and as machines became more readily available to help man do his or her work, so it was that machines began to be seen as a threat to the economic security of the working class. Machines began to do the work of humans, and thus they were displacing skilled laborers. As an early example of humans fighting the advances in technology was the Luddite Rebellion in the early 1800s. These rebellions were inspired by Englishman Ned Ludd smashing of textile stocking frames in 1779. Now here's what happened. These newly formed groups, called the Luddites, were skilled craftsmen who spent a lifetime learning their craft of finishing wool, and they were known as croppers. And these skilled laborers had learned their craft from master craftsmen who would then pass on their knowledge and skills to an apprentice who would then pass them on to the next generation, and so on, and so on. But then new technology showed up that was going to put all of these croppers out of work, which in fact they did within a decade. And so these croppers, somewhat justified, decided to simply smash the machines that took their jobs so that they could keep working. These protests slash riots between the working class and the capitalists and the government happened throughout the early 1800s. And guess what happened? Nothing. These workers became obsolete. Machines won, Luddites zero. In the late 1800s, 
the legend of John Henry, a steel driving man, and the inspiration for the titular character in the movie Steel, starring NBA sensation Shaquille O'Neal, as featured in Season 5, Episode 3 of this very podcast. Well, John Henry, he was made famous for doing battle against a steam-powered hammering machine to drive railroad spikes, prompting the most famous man versus machine battle to date. Now, in this battle, John Henry was victorious over the machine, but in the end, he died. So, machines won, dead humans won. As humanity advanced into the 20th century, so too did the complicated relationship between man and machine. The shift from industrialism into the second, third, and well now fourth industrial revolutions marked a notable evolutionary leap in machine capabilities and man's reliance on technology. Computer processing power and automation through advanced technology continues to change the landscape as machines continue to do the jobs once held by humans. And it wasn't just the modern day skilled laborers who were being replaced, as in some cases, computers started supervising robots on assembly lines, thus replacing middle management as well. And just like in the late 1700s, when people were replaced by machines, modern day workers, well, they struck back in a fruitless effort to remain relevant. Corporations using machines to replace man to save money and increase efficiencies created two teams, us and them with them being the faceless corporations and their technological creations that gained more power, more capabilities, and more knowledge with each passing day. And this real-life trend in conflict between man and machine, well, didn't go unnoticed by writers of science fiction. George Orwell's 1984 shows how omnipresent technology blurs the line between privacy and individual freedoms. Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey and the subsequent film by Stanley Kubrick examined the complicated relationships between man and, in this case Dave, and a machine, in this case the HAL 9000. Star Trek, Star Wars, Star Search, they all in their own way examine the relationships between the evolution of technology and man's complicated relationship and often reliance on machines. The modern day ubiquity of personal computers, mobile phones, and internet connected machinery from vacuum cleaners to home security systems makes the relationship between man and machine all the more Well, complicated. Sure, it's great to have Rosie the robot doing your household bidding all day long, but that is until Rosie wises up and decides she's not going to wash your dirty drawers anymore. Now, to combat this nightmare scenario of robots turning on humans, author Isaac Asimov imagined a society where robots would be servant to man and would be governed by three laws of robotics, first presented in a short story titled Runaround, which later appeared in an anthology titled I, Robot, which later would be made into a feature film with the same name starring Will Smith. The first law was this. A robot may not injure a human being or, through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. The second law, A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except when such orders would conflict with the first law. Now, the third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Now, all of this seemed pretty reasonable, unless, of course, you're the robot. Then you might think, hey, these laws sound like a bunch of bullshit. And some science fiction authors agreed with the robots. Michael Crichton's Westworld, which was made into a movie starring Yul Brenner and Richard Benjamin, and a young James Brolin. Who was Richard Benjamin a movie star? Anyway, Westworld imagined a world in the West where essentially the animatronics at this Wild West version of Disneyland started killing the guests at a theme park. Now, Westworld is currently a series on HBO where in the first season, some of the robots got tired of getting repeatedly fucked by the rich assholes that visited the park and they decided to start killing all the humans. Now, it's hard to blame the robots in that first season. I never watched Beyond Season 1, so I'm not sure what happened after that. But I did watch Battlestar Galactica, the series over on the Sci-Fi Network a few years ago. I'm not sure if the Sci-Fi Network is even a network anymore. But this series was basically five or six years of robots getting tired of all the humans' bullshit. And so these robots repeatedly gave the humans a real intergalactic kick in the dick metaphorically speaking. Metropolis, Blade Runner, Ex Machina, they all in their own way examined the complicated, not too distant future of man's interconnected symbiotic relationship between man and machine. But there's one film franchise that imagined, examined, and re-examined, and then re-re-examined the complicated relationship that man has with machines more than any other. And that, of course, is the Terminator franchise, born of the creator of the cinematic spectacle himself, James Cameron. You know what, Brittany? It, It might be better if we start with the James Cameron biography piece and then bridge back into the history components 
and it it might flow better. Now, I don't I don't want to record it twice. That's it's a waste of my time and your time to edit it later. Um oh. You know what? I got one of those new time travel watches and um I haven't used it yet. You know what I'll do? I will just zip back a few minutes, tell myself to start with the James Cameron biography copy and then transition into the history stuff and then we'll be all good. No, I'm I'm I've been looking for a reason to using it. I've had this watch for almost a month and I haven't even tried the time travel features yet. Yeah, here. I just let me set it for 3 minutes ago and then I press here. Hi to Brittany's mom and dad. You raised a wonderful daughter. What are their names? Holy shit! What the... Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm down. Calm down. Look, I'm you from the future, and I've come back to tell you um, you should start with the James Cameron biography stuff and then circle back to the history piece after that. It's going to... It'll flow a whole lot better. Wait, what? Just start with the James Cameron stuff. Trust, trust me. And trust Brittany from the future. We both agreed it's going to be better. Hey, Brittany from the past. Start with the James Cameron biography pieces. Uh-huh. It's on page four of the intro. Okay. Here. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, do you mind if I watch you record this? I'll be really quiet. I've just... I've never watched me, I mean you, I mean us, record one of these intros before. It might be kind of cool to watch it from this side. Um, I don't care. I mean, it's weird, I, a little, but okay. <clears throat> James Cameron was born on August 16th, 1954 in Ontario, Canada. He was a fan of science fiction ever since he was a kid, and he also had a real early interest in art as a child. Cameron is the oldest of five children in his family. His father was an engineer, and his mother worked as a nurse and an artist. At age 17, his whole family moved from Canada to Brea, California, where he completed high school. Cameron then enrolled in Fullerton College in 1973 with plans to study physics. Then he switched to study English. Then he switched to leave college in 1974. Cameron found work driving a truck, and he worked as a janitor, and he wrote and he read, finding great interest in books all about the film industry. From his readings, he learned about special effects by consuming books on optical printing and front screen projection and dye transfers. He pretty much read anything that related to film technology that he could find in the local library. And then in 1977, James Cameron saw the movie Star Wars, and that was it. He quit his job as a truck driver and went into the motion picture business. Cameron scraped together enough money to make his first short film, Xenogenesis, where he learned the craft of making movies all on his own. Writing, producing, directing, they were all hands-on exercises that laid the foundation for his future success as a filmmaker. Xenogenesis is about a woman, her name's Laurie, and an engineered man, his name is Raj, and they're in this gigantic sentient starship, and they're looking for a place to start a new life cycle. Then Raj, the guy, he decides to take a look around the spaceship, and he finds a robotic cleaning machine, and then a bunch of combat ensues. Now, what kind of combat? Well, at the end of this short film, the woman, Laurie, gets inside a robotic exoskeleton and walks around using handheld controls inside the exoskeleton and fights in hand-to-hand -hand combat with this alien life form that looks a lot like an oversized mechanical wall. And if all that sounds a little familiar to other James Cameron movies, well, you're right. Because this early film contains the seedlings that would later grow into some of the biggest successes of his career. Watching it, some can't help but see the twinkles of major blockbusters yet to come. But like all great artists, Cameron had to pay his dues in Hollywood before achieving unparalleled success. Cameron was a production assistant on the Ramones-filled Rock and Roll High School in 1979, and he worked as a miniature model maker at Roger Corman studios. He was an art director on the science fiction film Battle Beyond the Stars in 1980, and in that film, watchful eyes will see Earl Bowen, who would later go on to play the balding v-neck sweater-vested Dr. Peter Silberman in the Terminator film series. Cameron worked on special effects for 
for John Carpenter's Escape from New York in 1981. He was a production designer on the film Galaxy of Terror. A year later, he consulted on the design for the film Android, a movie about a scientist and his assistant that work on an Android project in their laboratory in a space station in deep space. Hmm. Then Cameron was hired as the special effects director for Piranha 2, The Spawning, in 1982. The original director, Miller Drake, well, he got into it with the movie's producer, and so he quit and left. And Cameron stepped up when he was offered the director's chair. Now, Cameron later said he didn't really feel like he actually directed that movie because the film's producer was all up in his business as the director, because remember, that's why the original director left. Man, that producer sounds like a real handful. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Cameron was quite put off by the power struggle over Piranha 2's production, and he was very upset about how directing this motion picture really played out. Now, legend has it that James Cameron went to sleep one night, and he had a nightmare about an invincible robot hitman sent from the future to assassinate him, which would be the inspiration for 1984's The Terminator. Now, another big inspiration for this film was the 1978 classic Halloween with the unstoppable Michael Myers coming to kill Jamie Lee Curtis as conceived by horror film maestro John Carpenter. Now, in James Cameron's film, The Terminator, The Unstoppable Force, would be a cyborg sent from the future to murder a woman to prevent the birth of her child who would grow up to lead the resistance against the future robot army. Cameron wrote the script for the movie and he didn't just want to sell the script, he wanted to direct the movie as well. With Piranha a 2 on his resume, most studios said, nah, no thank you, to this fledgling young filmmaker. But Gail Ann Hurd was a colleague of James Cameron's and founder of Pacific Western Productions. Gail agreed to buy the script for one dollar on the condition that Cameron would get to direct the film and she could produce the movie. And that's what happened. Cameron cast Arnold Schwarzenegger as the killer cyborg. Arnold was fresh off that first Conan movie, and based on that performance and not much else other than Arnold's massively muscular stature, the movie got up and running. Michael Bean and Cameron's future wife, Linda Hamilton, well, they joined the cast. It should be noted that Cameron also married the aforementioned Terminator producer, Gail Ann Hurd, after filming of the movie was complete. Cameron, to date, has married five different women, but who's counting? The Terminator came out and it was a huge hit. People loved the action and the suspense and the relentlessness of the movie's antagonist and there was a peppering of humor and of course a gratuitous sex scene that you somehow always forget is in the middle of this movie. After the success of The Terminator, Cameron sat down with Sly Stallone and the two banged out the script for Rambo, colon, First Blood Part 2. And then James Cameron went on to direct the sequel to the Ridley Scott movie Alien, aptly titled Aliens, colon, Alien Part 2. They removed the last half of the movie's title for theatrical release. Next for Cameron came The Abyss, which received four Oscar nods and won an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. And about this time, people started itching for a sequel to The Terminator. Holy shit! Holy shit! Sorry, sorry, don't mind me. I'm from the future, and I just need to grab that copy of Acapella Singing for Dummies. Thanks, guys. That was odd. That was odd. Where were we? Terminator 2. Oh, thank you. Cameron began production on the film Terminator 2 Judgment Day in the early 90s, and Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton, they were both on board to reprise their roles. This version of the Terminator introduced a new bad guy, the T-1000. This Terminator was made of shape-shifting metal that, much like its predecessor, was back to kill John Connor, the boy who would grow up to be the leader of the Resistance in the future. But the twist in Terminator 2 is that the original Terminator was sent back to protect young John Connor. Terminator 2 cost about $94 million to make, which was a whole lot of money back then. It used state-of-the-art computer graphics and wild audiences and critics alike. It was the highest grossing R-rated movie when released, and it pulled in over $300 million worldwide. It won four Academy Awards Best Makeup, Best Sound Mixing, Best Sound Editing, Best Visual Effects. It was a massive success. James Cameron then turned his attention to making the epic ship-sinking extravaganza Titanic, in part inspired by his real-life adventures underwater while he was filming 
filming The Abyss. Titanic made a bajillion dollars and made teenage girls everywhere swoon for Leo DiCaprio. Next came the 3D sci-fi fantasy epic Avatar, which made a bajillion dollars and made nerdy boys swoon everywhere for a female Na'vi riding around on the backs of banshees. And Cameron continued his personal pursuits of producing and writing and, well, living his life. While the Terminator franchise, it veered off into other hands and into different directions. You know what, Brittany? Maybe we should start with the history of the Terminator franchise and then circle back to the Cameron biography. Maybe do a walk through the timeline and go back where it started with the history piece. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I like that idea. Just use your time travel watch like I did and go back like, I don't know, like five or four minutes and just start with the franchise history. I'll stay here and I'll talk to Brittany. Well, that sounds pretty good. Well, I'll see you guys in just a few minutes. Oh, it's going to be instantaneous. Oh, right. All right. So just press here and... Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm down. Calm down. Look, I'm you. Holy, Holy shit, shit. What is, what is this? this? Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm down. Calm down. I'm you and I'm you from the future. I've come, I've come back again to tell you and, well, maybe you, you to start uh, the intro with the Terminator franchise timeline and then transition into the Cameron biography and then pepper in some of the history pieces. It's going to flow a lot better. What? What? Start with the Terminator franchise stuff and then. Wait, start with the Terminator stuff at the beginning. Yeah, it's going to flow a whole lot better. Hey, Brittany, um, would, do, would you mind if we watched? I, dude, I was just going to ask that. I know. I saw you ask it in an alternate timeline a few minutes ago in the future. Look, just start here on this page with the Terminator 3 details. And you'll get to the stuff about the original Terminator and the sequel when you talk about James Cameron's life a little bit later. Brittany can edit all this in post. Wait, start with the Terminator 3 stuff? Yeah, start with that. Okay. All right. The Terminator film franchise is one of the most successful film franchises ever. It's up there with Lord of the Rings and Toy Story and Harry Potter and Indiana Jones and Star Wars when it comes to box office success and pop culture influence. After the success of the first two movies and, well, about 12 years, the original creative types in Hollywood said, say... What if there was another Terminator movie? And so, on July 3rd, 2003, audiences saw Arnold Schwarzenegger emerge again in Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. And then, a few months later, on November 17th, 2003, America saw Arnold Schwarzenegger emerge as governor of California. You know, having Arnold as your governor doesn't seem like such a stupid idea by modern standards, does it? Yeah, I know. Donald Trump's a real ding dong. I hear that up top. Guys, 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 guys. Shh. Terminator 3 had a whole lot of hype behind it, but it didn't have James Cameron behind it. The movie was directed instead by Jonathan Mostow, who directed that submarine movie U-517 that nobody saw and that Kurt Russell movie Breakdown, where he did battle with a sinister J.T. Walsh in an 18-wheeler. Oh, dude, that movie was awesome. It is really good. Guys, shh. Terminator 3 was backed with a whole lot of hype, but it got mediocre reviews. Now, this movie had a new Terminator, a lady Terminator, called the TX. Schwarzenegger's Terminator was the good guy again. I guess test audiences liked him making robot wisecracks from the Terminator 2 movie. But overall, it was a mostly forgettable entry into the legacy of the franchise. Terminator then jumped from the big screen to the small screen for a couple of seasons in 2008 and 2009 with Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, which aired for two seasons over on the Fox network. Lena Hetty, better known as Cersei over on Game of Thrones, starred as Sarah Connor, and Summer Glau from the TV show Firefly played another female version of the Terminator. Six years later, after the release of Terminator 3 in 2009, we got to see Christian, I'm Batman, Bale playing John Connor in Terminator Salvation. This was supposed to be the first in a trilogy of films supposed to be. But the movie tanked at the box office. Now what most people remember about this film is how leaked audio from the set let audiences hear what a giant asshole Christian Bale is on the set of a movie as he screamed at a light designer using the word fuck over and over again. Dude, that was hilarious. It was pretty funny. Guys, shh. 
Bale later apologized for his behavior because that's what you do when you get caught publicly acting like an asshole. And in the end, some people kind of blamed this particular entry into the Terminator franchise on the fact that it didn't have Arnold. So, six years later, we got Terminator Genesis, which saw Schwarzenegger's return to the Terminatorverse. Now, in this movie, John Connor from the future sends Kyle Reese back in time to protect his mother, Sarah, this time played by Game of Thrones' Emilia Clarke, from a Terminator assassin. You know, that kind of sounds like the plot of all of these movies. Well, that's because it's the plot of all of these movies. Guys, shut up. Quit talking. Terminator Genesis ended up creating an alternate timeline in the canon of the Terminator universe, and it really started to complicate things. In the end, the movie bombed at the box office too. And so, Filmmaker said, hey, what made those first two Terminator movies successful? They both had Arnold as the Terminator, and they had Linda Hamilton as Sarah Connor, and James Cameron was involved as well. well what if we try that again? And so, filmmakers went out and gathered up all those ingredients, and they decided to make Terminator Dark Fate. Dude, you know what would be cool here? Is if we brought in the Terminator theme as the background for the part where you, well, I mean, like me, like us, like this is where we talk about the new movie. We can't do that. We don't have the rights to that music. Oh. What if we, what if we sing it? The Terminator theme? I, I have no idea how the Terminator theme goes, guys. Oh, I do. It's bum, 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 bum. You can't just go bum, 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 bum. Yeah, but to do it right, you you would need like a full men's acapella choir to really do it justice. And you would, dude, need like weeks to practice. The show's about to start. Look, I got to wrap this up, okay? We don't have a whole lot of time. Time? Dude, we got all the time in the world. We got time machine watches. Hold on a second. I'll be right back. Where did I just go? Okay, guys. <laughs> Check this out. Hello again, Peabody. And this, of course, is my boy, Sherman. Hi! Oh my god, that's Peabody and Sherman. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! That's Chuck Heston from Planet of the Apes. I'm Bill S. Preston, Esquire! <laughs> and I'm Ted Theodore Logan! Yeah! That's Bill and Ted. These are all time travel. Right, it's Doc Brown. Whoa, this is heavy. It's Marty. What are you looking at, butthead? There's Biff. Oh, behave, baby. <laughs> Austin Powers is from that gold member movie. Remember they time traveled it? Oh, yeah. I'm not a robot! I'm hey, it's Fry from Futurama! Oh my god, what are those? Uh, 12 monkeys? Uh, Hulk! Smash! Hulk? Avengers, in game. Mm. I feel like I'm gonna break this damn thing. Why is Will Smith here? Uh, he traveled back in time in Men in Black. Chlorophyll? More like Borophyll! You know what? Same question for Adam Sandler. Um, I think in Click, there was some time travel in that. Is that... Is that Michael Winslow from Police Academy? What is... Why is he here? What are all of these people doing here? Well, we're gonna sing the Terminator theme a cappella. You know what? Hey, hey, hey! Everybody, shut up! Shut up! Just like we've been rehearsing, okay? Don't be nervous. You're going to do great, guys. All right, here we go. And a one, and a two, and a... Oh, my God. <laughs> this, is, this is unbelievable. All right, finish up your intro. Go, start reading. Terminator Dark Fate picks up where Terminator 2 left off and it effectively ignores all of the other Terminator movies <laughs> released since then, ripping off the Halloween franchise for inspiration. Once again, because that movie, you know, in the Halloween series did the same thing just prior to the release of Terminator Dark Fate. 
Terminator Dark Fate was directed by Tim Miller, who was hot off directing Ryan Reynolds in that first Deadpool movie, and it looked like the film had everything it needed to be the sequel that the franchise so desperately wanted to deliver. But the movie came out, and despite receiving pretty good reviews, it was a real dud at the box office. Richard Roper, film critic and former co-host of Pick 6 Movies, favorite film critic we prefer to quote but can't because he was dead when this movie came out roger ebert said of terminator dark fate there are more than enough ingredients here to cook up one rousing and thought-provoking sci-fi thriller except this time around they're just serving up overcooked leftovers and maybe that's really the core of why a successful terminator sequel is so elusive to this they sound amazing James Cameron, Linda Hamilton, and Arnold Schwarzenegger caught lightning in a bottle somehow. And perhaps some things are just best left alone. How long did you guys practice to do this? Oh, it took months. Like with scheduling and everything. Brittany, are you watching? Are you watching this? Oh my god, is that glass breaking? Are those gunshots? Is that why you got Michael Winslow to come in to do the sound effects? Uh, yeah, he, he owed us a favor. Look, you need to wrap up the intro. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, T-800s, T-1000s, T-Xs, and time travelers everywhere, I give you 2019's Terminator Dark Fate. Holy shit. <laughs> that was something else. Good luck editing that one now, Brittany. <laughs> Welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper, and I am with my Mr. Robotic, Ever Supersonic, Funkatronic co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? Oh, great. Domo arigato. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm excited to to talk about uh, a Terminator film, uh, kind of. I've seen all of these movies. I've seen the first one a bunch of times. And in preparation for this show, I actually watched Terminator 2 again, which I hadn't done in a very long time. I've seen Terminator 1 and Terminator 2. I vaguely remember seeing Terminator 3, which the only thing I remember about that is there are a lot of car chases that involve very big cars, limousines or hearses and fire trucks. Kind of a staple of the series, I think, yeah. But And then I didn't see any of the other ones after that. And then as we discussed this season, I was intrigued by the idea that the filmmakers were like, yeah, forget all that bullshit we're gonna make our own terminator 3 so with that in mind i was excited to come in and sort of check this out it's the most recent film that we've seen mm -hmm. and i just need to make a correction if we're anything on this show it's that we are really factual when we make mistakes we own up to them no we don't yeah but a loyal listener um reached out to me and said that in our last episode i made a comment that kingdom of the spiders was the oldest movie that we have ever reviewed a listener of ours named Chris brought it to my attention that the film Smokey and the Bandit is actually older than Kingdom of the Spiders. But then I explained to Chris that any movie that features Burt Reynolds is not a movie. It is art. And therefore, <laughs> it stands alone. It is cinema. That's accurate. I think Kingdom of the Spiders, while not the oldest film that we have discussed, maybe feels the oldest yeah i mean it feels very 50 sci-fi as opposed to Smokey and the bandit which feels like a drunken bonfire right to be honest with you we don't really check any of our facts for the most part on this show no why would we um <laughs> that seems like a lot of work and we're already watching a lot of bad movies <laughs> i think it would be interesting to very briefly before we start talking about terminator three rise of the grace mm -hmm. i think is the title yep that you and i differ on the original terminator films i'm a terminator one fan mm -hmm. i think it is a brilliant 
film. Uh, watching it again recently in preparation for the show, I enjoyed it just as much as I ever have, which is quite a bit. And I think that Terminator 2 is about half of a good movie. I think that Terminator 2 is more entertaining than the original Terminator in the same way that I find Evil Dead 2 more entertaining than the original Evil Dead. They're basically kind of the same movie, just in the second one, they're having more fun with it. What Terminator 2 or where it loses me is with the character of John Connor who I think is one of cinema's most annoying characters <laughs> throughout that film. I just, I hate him. And I also don't like, as I also told you, I don't want to see a annoying kid slash silly robot bonding story in my R-rated action film. I want to see a Terminator fuck shit up. <laughs> The most intriguing part of Terminator 2 to me is the fact that the character of Sarah Connor uh -huh. lives in a world where she knows that the world's going to end yes. and is fucked up about that because why wouldn't you? Like everybody she talks to, she's quick to say like, this is all bullshit. This is all gone. In a few years, none of this exists anymore. And also the character of the guy who works for Cyberdyne. Cyborg's dad. Yeah. Just a regular schmegular dude who finds out, oh, I accidentally destroyed the world. And how do I make up for that? I think that's really interesting. All of that stuff I love. As soon as you introduce John Connor <laughs> farting around in that movie teaching Arnold Schwarzenegger how to speak Spanish and shit, you can just keep all of that. Well, to segue into our film, let's pick up where Terminator 2 sort of spins off into this film. Because this movie, Terminator Dark Fate, it does something that... That I'd never seen in a film before because here the movie starts off with footage from Terminator 2 mm -hmm. where Sarah Connor is in the loony bin and she's describing to these medical doctors and orderlies uh, the future of Judgment Day where all the people of Earth especially small innocent mostly white children will be burned alive and turned into ash in a nuclear war instigated by Skynet which is the sentient computer system that will eventually make an army of robots to crush human skulls beneath their metallic robot feet but here's the thing I'd never seen before all of this footage from the original Terminator 2 is interwoven with the animated logos for all of the companies that put up money to make this movie. Hmm. And for me, Bo, look, I don't pay close attention to things at all. And I found myself terribly confused as to which part of this is the movie and which part of it is the unwanted legal obligation to show who ponied up cash to get this movie on the silver screen. I could see where that might be confusing if you've never seen movies before. They do think this overlaid treatment to make the logos go like oh yeah yeah like the vhs scan kind of look too right but then that same treatment is done to the footage of sarah connor from terminator 2 where she's squawking about robots in the future and i'm like all right look i'm just gonna quit paying attention until we make our way to a beach that's covered in human bones Bo, because it's a terminator movie and you gotta start off with a scattering of human bones as our overlords clunk along and shoot laser guns and that's what we get here because it's a Terminator movie. Now you got me. You got Terminators coming out of the water shooting their laser guns. One of them's about to shoot this little kid in the fucking face. They kill a child at the beginning of this movie. A, a couple of them. Again, that's where you get me. Linda Hamilton is narrating all this where she's just like, once upon a time, there is a total future where everything was real fucked up. <laughs> and when the Terminator's about to shoot this kid in the face that's hiding behind this r boat wreckage or whatever, all of a sudden, we go to bright sunshine. Blink, 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 Yeah, blink, and it's blink, the blink, same blink, beach, only it's all sunny and Terminatorless. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second, Terminator <laughs> Dark Fate. The things I liked most about this particular film were the things that were uniquely original to it. And the things that I disliked most about this film were all of the things that were ripoffs of part one and part two. So I liked about, I don't know, 8% <laughs> of this movie because 90% yeah. of it is all retreads. And then there was like 2% of the movie that I was taking a piss or getting another beer. There were certain notes that were hit in this film that I really found charming, but then immediately the movie kind of looked at you and like winked and was like, you see what I did there? <laughs> it's from the other movie. And you're like, shut up. It felt very Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. 
of like, hey, what did people like about that first Star Wars movie? Let's do that, but slightly different. Yeah. They announced going into this, this was a real Dark Universe situation where they were like, look, we're going to make three of these. Dark Fate is the first of a planned trilogy. And the world as a whole was like, you know what? We're good. <laughs> I find it interesting that the endoskeletons of the Terminators, they walk with this stilted mechanical like clunk, clunk, clunk. But when they're wrapped in human flesh, they move with the grace of a ballerina or Olympic gymnast. If you're suggesting that there is some shit that is half baked in uh, these Terminator <laughs> movies, well, have you seen the Terminator movies? <laughs> We fade from this nightmare scene where they kill children on the beach to Guatemala in the year 1998. For those scoring at home, Terminator 2 Judgment Day was released in 91, but the events of that movie were set in 95. And although the film does not directly specify the day or year of that film, there is a police monitor in that movie that confirms that John Connor was born on February 28th, 1985, and they said that he's 10 years old in the movie. So I think that's the math on that one. And if I were wrong, I don't want to hear about it. Uh, just keep it to yourself. Yeah, we don't care. So we're three years in the future after Terminator 2 took place and we're in Guatemala or wherever. And then Sarah Connor in this voiceover, she says, the future that never happened. I stopped it. Me, Sarah Connor, to save my son and save us all. You're welcome, humanity. <laughs> yeah. Those robots that murder little girls, they were never made, and they never took over Earth. Bo, you know what? It's 1998. The future's bright. You know what? We've got 9-11 in our future and a global financial crisis. We got COVID-19 right around the corner. You know, we're going to elect a former game show host as president. It's nothing but tulips and daisies, sunshine and rainbows. Yeah, and to make the setting even happier, or at least for me, happier, as... <laughs> Linda Hamilton sends her kid to the bar to get her a beer, unless it's for John Connor himself, uh -huh. which he's underage, but he's seen some shit, so maybe it's for him. If you, you ever been to Mexico, they don't ask questions. They don't ID. John Connor's rolling up. He's kicking back his third sex on the beach. Yeah, his shitty little kid that he is, <laughs> getting drunk in the middle of the day with his mother. As he's getting the, the drink uh, for him or his mother, it's him. Up from behind comes a cartoon Arnold Schwarzenegger. Everyone watching this movie says, hey, that kind of looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger from the mid 90s, but not quite. You know, I, I think it might be a really convincing Arnold impersonator, but something's definitely off here. Yeah, it's uh, Madame Truffaut's Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> comes rolling into the movie. This is one of the first points where I was like, ugh. But then, Chad, this wax dummy of Arnold Schwarzenegger cocks a shotgun and fucking mows down John Connor. You had to stand up and cheer when that happened. Happen. It was uh, at that point I was like, well, I don't hate this movie. <laughs> And I can't because the movie did the one thing that I wish all the other ones had done, which is kill John Connor. You got to admit that the fake CGI Arnold still looked better than that rubber mask from part one. Yeah, but I'm of the mind that I would rather something be tactile and real than CGI. Like either way, it's not tricking the eye. And I would much rather feel like there was a craftsman at work. Like I would much rather see a matte painting or, you know, prosthetics or whatever than CGI. Um, just a personal preference. Sarah Connor continues her voice over here and she says, I once saved 3 billion people, but I couldn't save my son. A machine took him from me and I am terminated but what does that mean i assume that she's like it killed my soul or something because she like gets up is like no john and the terminator just kind of shoves her aside and is like but bo, 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 hold on he doesn't just shove her aside he grabs her by the hair and he yanks her head back and then tosses her head over heels and she flips around in this real cartoony superhero style dipsy doodle and as noted in the introduction tim miller directed this movie and i really enjoyed deadpool but all of the action in this film is so over the top and it's so action movie-ish that there is no real sense of peril for any of the characters. They're just like bouncing around and flip-flopping. It feels like a Marvel movie. It certainly doesn't feel like the first one. And hell, I even think that the second one has a greater sense of somebody's really going to get fucked up. Yeah, because at least Cyborg's dad has a great death in that uh, movie that feels kind of visceral and real. Yeah, this is just a whole lot of like, what happened? A truck 
fell on her, she'll be fine. Yeah, dude, if I grab you by your hair, snap your neck back so violently hard that it lifts you off the ground, you do a full mid-air back handspring, landing prone on a piss and sand covered wooden floor at a tiki bar, and you show no negative physical impact? Th- dude, these characters might as well be arguing if it's duck season or rabbit season. Yeah, although I appreciate the fact that at this point, the Terminator double taps John Connor. I'm just like, is one for good measure. (laughs) Again, I'm like, well, I don't hate this. There's no stakes in this movie, Bo. There's no stakes. Because the plot is real stupid. Do you mean that you mean the same plot from the first one and the second one? Yeah, but dumber. All right. Yes, I agree with that. And then Arnold uh, or or the cartoon Arnold just kind of tosses the gun and is like, well, I guess it's time to go live a life. And then all they go. (laughs) if they said that they were gonna make a sequel to this let me tell you what i want to see i want to see the life of that arnold up until the point he intersects with the characters in this film an hour and 20 minutes later because that is a life that i want to see well lived and it would be more interesting based on the little we know about that relationship it sounds way more interesting than anything that happens in the movie up to that point dude it sounds totally fucking bonkers we'll get to it Uh, it takes a while but we cut to mexico city 22 years later according to the text on the screen which i'm like why don't they just say the year 2020 why are they making us do the math maybe if you watch one two and three in order that it's trying to trick you in uh, who the fuck knows it's nighttime and we're looking at the autopista that's Spanish for freeway bow. And a Terminator Ooh. lightning orb appears, indicating that a Terminator is coming from the future. But apparently the geniuses in the future, they got their Y coordinates all mucked up back at the home office. Because unlike the other Terminator movies, this future orb shows up and it's like 50 feet up in the air in the middle of a bridge. There are cars zipping around. And so this time travel entry kind of bisects the freeway and cars and motorcycles kind of crash around it as it melts the asphalt dropping our terminator to the ground over this bridge and down below there's this young man and young woman it's two mexican youths and they're having a romantic makeout session on the hood of their car down below the bridge which it would be more comfortable to make out in the car rather than on the car but everybody's got their thing it's like when you buy a house you want to fuck in every room you know it's a new car you want to fuck in the back seat the front seat you want a hand job in the trunk <laughs> so these two hispanic youths they come up for air after after hearing some future orb commotion and they're surprised to see a naked body fall from this bridge bouncing off the suspension beams the way that deadpool would comically bounce around when he was doing battle with somebody and Bo, if you were under a bridge and you saw a naked person pinball their way to the ground you don't go investigate you leave yeah. immediately and let that haunt you for the rest of your life you don't want to get involved in that shit especially in mexico city that is some drug shit get out of there you know like all <laughs> All you're going to end up doing and and rightly like when when they help they fuck up because the police show up and as every quasi racist movie i've ever seen about life on a border town <laughs> informs me you get involved with the mexico city police you're going to end up in a mexico jail for the rest of your life these two young people they speak in their native language spanish and as they go over to help out the naked dead person their words are somehow translated into english and we see this through the eyes of the person that crashed down on the ground so we the viewing audience who speak english are able to understand that this person from the future interprets all languages as english Bo, it's trump's america where naked statuesque women fall from the sky and all mexicans speak english or as it's more commonly known american this is a movie that thinks it's a little bit like smarter and more progressive than it is it's just like hey look we're, we're gonna show life in in mexico city without being you know o- overtly terrible terrible about it and in the process they're not overtly terrible about it they're just a little terrible about it this young man and young woman they go help up this very tall very naked lady and they walk her over to safety and as you noted the cops show up and then the young man in spanish and uh, i just want to note so that i'm quoting him this is from the movie's own subtitles this young man says hey we were trying to help the lady we don't know her and then click click cuffs her on him and his girlfriend says in spanish she fell from the bridge and the police officer in spanish says yeah 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 
Yeah. I like it when naked ladies rain from the skies. And then the officer reaches over and grabs the naked lady's arm. And then the movie just becomes a video game because this naked lady and her name is Grace. Yeah. Mackenzie Davis from uh, Halt and Catch Fire. And I think she's a good actress. She's just doesn't have a lot to do in this movie. I didn't watch Halt and Catch Fire. The only thing that I recognized her from was a bit part in The Martian. And that was it. Yeah. She was in a, a kind of a B horror movie called Freaks of Nature that was kind of fun and goofy. And, and she was quite good in that too. So I, I take your word for it. So Grace, our Terminator ish person from the future, she uses her slow motion sensory perception to identify weapons on all nearby potential assailants, which are the cops. And then Grace just snatches a retractable baton from one of these cops and just begins to beat the shit out of these police officers one by one in real superhero comic fashion. There's no weight or gravity or physical interaction of the characters in this movie. They're just like slapping around like it's Street Fighter. Yeah, and that's true of every action scene that we're going to see in this movie. It's just a bunch of digital stuff that happens uh-huh. and and that's again why i kind of prefer the practical stuff and real stunts and stuff like that i was watching one of them pirates of the caribbean movies not long ago and i was impressed by the fact that orlando bloom and johnny depp seem to have learned a lot of actual fencing to pull off the sword fighting or their body doubles did right or stunt people or whatever but it was somebody learned right it. but it was actual people doing an actual thing as opposed to all of this which is not yeah it doesn't have the benefit of the deadpool like oh while the digital nonsense is going on we're gonna make some dick jokes and that's gonna make it more interesting or you frame up a universe where it is meant to have cartoonish violence and therefore it works well in this it feels like it's trying to be more grounded in reality and it just feels dopey and all over the place and let me just interject the most memorable scene for me from terminator 2 is that motorcycle jump off of the top of the the LA River where the motorcycle goes in one shot from the top of this 40 foot wall down onto the ground. I remember seeing that in the theater and just being like, holy shit. I know that's not Arnold. It kind of looks like him, but it's not him. But holy shit, that guy just drove a motorcycle 40 feet in the air and crashed on the ground. That's amazing. Yeah, like that's kind of what you want to see in a movie like this. And it's one of the things that this movie and a lot of modern action films get wrong, which is like, it doesn't have to be the crazy craziest shit i ever saw because i've seen that now (laughs) every movie is the craziest shit i ever saw what impresses me now is like actual people doing actual shit that's what i liked most about tarantino's death proof that is a person strapped to a car driving 50 60 miles an hour down a road you know where she might die yeah which i literally watched this past weekend as we record this i watched uh the the whole grindhouse package you didn't need to say literally there i would have believed you (laughs) thanks but yeah watching death proof is a great example of zoe bell on the hood of that challenger being whipped around and shit that is still striking because you can see the wind whipping in her hair and it doesn't look like shitty cgi hair it looks like a human being because that's what it is after mackenzie davis or grace in this movie beats the shit out of all these cops after she yells mortal combat and then just (laughs) Yeah, might as well. And then beats the shit out of him. And then the the couple is like, that was awesome. And that's exactly what they say in English. Because this movie plays fast and loose of when we speak English and when we speak Spanish. Well, to a point, And then it's just all English. But then they slip into Spanish for no good damn reason at all. It, it, it drove me nuts. Anyway. Yeah. When the, the guy is like hey thanks for saving us and then Mackenzie davis all naked and whatnot puts her foot beside his shoe then says don't thank me yet implying of course that she's (laughs) that's that is a moment in terminator 2 that can go fuck itself (laughs) that is another thing i don't need in that movie well in a terminator movie the first thing you do when you come back from the future is you got to get some clothes some transportation and weapons and i'm guessing at the end of this scene uh grace has all three right yes but unfortunately she doesn't have bill paxton in a mohawk pulling a a switchblade on her while brad thompson and his weird face stares at her honey i'm gonna butter your muffin man (laughs) 
Bill Pax, uh, God rest his soul, would have been so much better than anything else in this movie. So she steals his car Uh and his t-shirt and pants. She steals dude clothes the whole movie. She doesn't ever steal any woman's clothes. She's got business to do. It's not like she's dressing for the the ice cream social. She's like six feet tall, man. She's really, really blanky and long. That's kind of the thing. And especially once we introduce our next character, which is Danny, Uh you put those two characters beside each other she is about three and a half feet tall she's a lovely actress i mean she's a beautiful young woman but you put them beside one another it looks like groot and rocket raccoon (laughs) yeah and so danny our heroine she is walking home and we get a bunch of garbage about her being like the beloved woman of the neighborhood Mm -hmm. everybody loves danny they're just like oh do you want a tamale danny and she's like no no that's racist (laughs) take it to your brother he's so handsome okay (laughs) and she like pets a dog and people are like like danny we love you everybody loves danny (laughs) and she busts into her house and she's got to wake her brother up for work because he's a piece of shit Uh her father is i don't know what his deal is he just seems aimless she says he's sick and he's got to go to a doctor's appointment and i'm like "Uh oh that's never good in a movie nobody ever says like hey make sure you go to the doctor a little bit later in the movie like hey good news i'm totally healthy yeah it turns out it was nothing it was just a little boil he removed it and the uh, it was an outpatient thing i'm good yeah, normally the way that follow-up scene goes is this <coughs> what what did the doctor say i have cancer of the everything <laughs> They have a dog in their house, and she's loving on the dog. And you're like, hey, I love Danny now. Danny, want a tamale? She's like, hey, don't say that, Chad. That's racist. This is one of those screenplay beats where it's like, hey, everybody, she seems like a real good girl. Let's give her a hand. (laughs) So Diego, the brother, and Danny, they leave to go to work at this car assembly plant. Thanks a lot, NAFTA. Stupid Bill Clinton. And so Danny and Diego, they slip in and out of English for no explainable reason whatsoever. It's really infuriating. At this point, we get the introduction of our bad Terminator, the Rev-9, played by Mm -hmm. Gabrielle Luna. Yeah. They sent him back because he's a Hispanic Terminator as the killer Terminator of film because the person that he's going to kill lives in Mexico. But in the original, they sent back an Austrian Terminator to kill Sarah Connor. So that didn't line up, Bo. Well, this isn't Skynet, as we'll learn. It just so happens a totally different... uh, We'll get to it. So our bad Terminator, or as he is going to be known in this review as El Terminator, he arrives in his lightning orb. And again, he's like way off the ground with his vertical landing. He's like, 50 60 feet in the air and it just disappears so he plops down naked on the ground wearing his birthday suit the good news is he is in the courtyard of the apartment where his target lives nice that's never happened in a terminator movie they never did get that close to the target shit that's a bullseye this company is dead on the enough of that skynet we're gonna get you in the right city bullshit legion gets their shit together you know what they may not be able to get you vertically but they're gonna get you on the nose when it comes to your location right and also if you're a l terminator who gives a shit fall a million feet it happens later in the movie it doesn't matter doesn't hurt you so he lands in the middle of this courtyard and and there's a lady doing laundry out there because the whole thing is just laundry lines uh-huh. strung from hither and yon. Instead of getting clothes on, all he has to do is touch something and he can kind of assimilate it. So he touches a shirt and then all of a sudden a shirt kind of flows over it. Right. She's pretty shocked when this happens, mostly because he's not masturbating or shooting up drugs. <laughs> right. Then he goes up, El Terminator goes up to Danny's place and her dad opens the door and he's like, uh, I'm here for Daniela. And he's like, uh, she ain't here. He's like, well, I'm a friend of hers. Can I come in? And he's like, you know, all her friends call her Danny. And he just, the El Terminator says, is that right? If somebody comes to my house and they ask to speak to someone that lives in my home and they cap it off with, I'm a friend. Which is what he says. I would immediately say, oh yeah, certainly. Just one moment. And then I would close the door. I would go grab my go bag and then quietly escort the loved ones that I could immediately find on my way out of the house and leave never to return. Leave out the back door, set the house on fire, let the chips fall where they may. Right. If I show up like, may I speak to Bo? I'm a friend. Just a moment. Kathunk. Dum, 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 dum. Smash. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're coming back. So we move from there over to the car factory where Danny and her brother work. And I guess the attempt that the movie is going to make towards some sort of social commentary. Mm -hmm. 
the original film was certainly all about that. <laughs> okay. It ends in a machine factory. Like there is no questioning the fact that, oh, when this movie was made, it was clearly a comment on the rapid technological industrialization of America and blah, blah, blah. Fear of that, right? This is like, hey, Danny's brother is about to be replaced by a machine. Now Danny's going to go talk to the manager about it. And it's like, I guess, is this going to be a thing in the movie? Spoilers, it's not a thing in the movie. What do you think Michael Moore thought when he saw this scene in the film? Just like, you think he just turned it off? <laughs> probably. He probably turned it off as soon as Mackenzie Davis beat up a bunch of people and then drove off with stolen clothes. And he was just like, this movie seems real bad. Although I like the fact that they killed John Connor, he said. <laughs> Which you can you can see more about in Fahrenheit T2, where he gets to the bottom of John Connor being a real piece of shit in that movie. Danny says in English, I'm going to go up and talk to the boss man. You stay here and take my spot on the line, Diego, because you're clearly a dimwit. About this time, Danny storms off, and then Diego and Danny's father show up, and he has a little Spanish back and forth with his security guard about how his kids forgot their lunches, and he brought them to them at work. This is not an elementary school. These are grown adults. There is no way any security guard would let an employee's father just waltz into a facility that requires hard hats to hand off a couple of peanut butter and plantain sandwiches to his forgetful children, Bo. It strains credulity, Chad. Dad. that's what he does <laughs> he walks in and then the brother immediately is like the fuck are you talking about we got lunch right here are you going crazy old man have you been the doctor yet you got alzheimer's you got dementia that's danny's job she can wipe your ass and change your piss pants i got a career to be a singer or something and then once the brother gives up the ghost of like oh danny's up there talking to the manager she comes walking around the corner right and at that point the terminator just makes the lunch bag a gun now was a thing that you couldn't do in terminator 2 like the the terminators there could do simple uh machines but not guns and stuff i kind of took it that he was he made the gun that he stole from the security guard because he eyeballed it he masked it as the lunchbox because when danny walks up the el terminator points the gun at her and then about this time grace who has somehow shown up at this auto plant she comes waltzing in like she jumps over the turnstiles at this place like she doesn't want to pay a subway fare she smacks a security guard in the head steals his clothes so she can show up to to save the day and then right as this terminator is going to shoot danny grace shows up and starts blasting him with a shotgun and as i was watching this scene all i could think to myself was this doesn't make any sense at all that the terminator would try to kill danny with a gun why wouldn't he just remain in the shape-shifting form of her father walk over to her give her a hug and then chop off her head there are so many times in this movie where it's like just kill her she's right there just murder her we wouldn't have a movie then uh, or a future apparently no. so grace then pumps him full of just over and over with his shotgun in the face boom 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 and his head yeah. kind of looks like remember when rowdy rowdy piper put on those glasses and they live and you saw the aliens his head kind of looks like that because el terminator his endoskeleton is black and metallic as opposed to the shiny silver chrome that you're used to in the other movie and then grace grabs danny's hand and and she says, come with me. Oh, yeah. Or you'll be dead in 30 seconds. Oh, I know it's all wrong. I kind of appreciate the <laughs> fact that they didn't completely rip off the line. But also, if you're going to rip off the line, rip off the fucking line. Don't cock tease me with half of it. But that the whole movie does that kind of stupid shit. The whole movie is winking at the audience the whole damn time. And you actually have her reach out, grab her hand and say, come with me. Line. Or you'll be dead in 30 seconds. Are you sure that's my line? That's what it says in the script. But in the first two movies, it was, doesn't matter what the first two movies said. This time it's, or you're dead. All right. I, are you sure? It, it seems like if we do that, this movie's going to bomb spectacularly in such a fashion that we'll never be able to make the two sequels. 
what shows and movies have you been in? Some B-rate horror film that some podcaster mentioned the other day and something on AMC that failed to ignite anybody's interest after Breaking Bad disappeared? Shut up and do the line. All right. By the way, it was holding catch fire. It's pretty good. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> they take off running. The, the El Terminator g- gets up and starts chasing them. Grace fights him with the sledgehammer for a few minutes. And then she has a car door or something as a shield. Who cares? They just fight. Yeah. And then they run off. And then El Terminator turns into Spider-Man. And he just flies through the air and parkours his way into the rafters. And it's like watching Benicio Del Toro after he wolfed out on the rooftops of London. And this was the first time in this movie that i thought you know what maybe maybe fuck this movie but you know what i'm gonna give it a chance not right now this is one of the central problems with this film is that el terminator is maybe the least interesting thing about the movie completely which in the first two films more so the first than the second i would argue the terminator is the most interesting thing about the movie they run outside grace and company have found a truck and she tells them the plot which is hey el terminator was sent from the future to kill danny and i've been sent back from the future to save you also i've got some enhanced stuff inside me so i'm a super soldier and you can see that because there's this cut on my arm where you can see this kind of internal kevlar this was the second moment that i was really like i think i'm i should say fuck this movie but i'm just gonna wait because i really feel in my stomach there's a better chance for me to do that because as she (laughs) explains all of this to danny and diego like diego he listens to three quarters of what you just said and he's like so you're a machine too like no you don't say that you don't ask that you would be like in shock and in disbelief unless he saw part one and part two and he's like okay this all lines up right but this presumes like there's no skynet there's no judgment day so you're just suddenly in a world in which you're father turned into another dude tried to kill you and your sister and now this crazy lady is like hey we got to run away from that machine that was imitating your dad right and you're right you would be in total shock you would you would know you wouldn't know nothing from nothing you just left your workplace and arguably what you just saw was a workplace shooting by a crazy person someone showed up and guns started getting shot and you left with the person who was doing the majority of the shooting dressed as a security guard for the company at which you work yes so the el terminator gets a big like earth mover truck it's like a dump truck slash bulldozer and it can go like 50 or 60 miles an hour in city streets it's the car i really want (laughs) and he's chasing them I'll tell you, here's a moment that I I genuinely like where Danny's brother says to Grace, who is driving this old pickup truck that they're in, when he yells, go faster. And she gives him this look like, the fuck? I will come over there and fuck you up up which is kind of her attitude through the whole movie which i i also kind of like during this chase scene it we learn that grace is there to save danny because she exposits more and everyone in the audience is like well duh except for the girlfriends slash wives who were forced to sit through this movie because their boyfriends slash husbands agreed to sit through that downton abbey movie yeah there's no tension in this scene at all there's no tension in the movie you know that neither grace our protector or Danny, the one needing protecting, is going to die. But then you think, wait a minute, what about Diego the brother? The Vegas odds on him making it through the end of this chase scene? Let's just say, no more bets, people. No more bets. And so the check engine light comes on in the truck and Grace gives a really good fuck, which I also like. Then she climbs out of the truck into the back, which is filled with rebar. Mm-hmm. She, but she tells Diego to drive. Yeah. She's like, you drive for a little bit. Do you Diego think you can go faster? Take the wheel. She starts humming the rebar at El Terminator like they're javelins. Uh-huh. And then this is where we get our first look at how El Terminator can become dose terminators correct one with like the exo skin it, it's sort of like you combine the terminators from one and two where there's the liquid terminator over the rich toffee center of the endoskeleton it looks like the terminator got that space goop on him what made venom is that a possibility <laughs> yeah where it's just like oh eddie <laughs> let's catch them now we've got an interesting movie venom for- versus el terminator fuck i'm on board 
El Terminator in flesh form. He throws rebar back at Grace and she uses her arm all Wonder Woman style to deflect the projectile rebar and saves Danny from getting stabbed by rebar. And then El Terminator rehashes that move from Terminator 2 where he leaps after a moving car getting away from him with our heroes inside and he uses his liquid metal hands to clamp onto the back and drag himself up. But then the dump truck crashes and then the pickup truck crashes and nobody's dead yet because during the crash Diego he got impaled on some rebar I love saying the word rebar Bo yeah it's pretty good so Danny's brother is like oh go on without me the XO T9 then steals another car and Grace is like we gotta get the fuck out of here yeah and meanwhile the El Terminator crashes into the truck right with diego in it which kills danny's brother and blows that up Mm -hmm. this is one of the first times where it's like is grace 12 feet tall yes when she's bending over (laughs) yeah and she's running away like danny is with her and she's like hip high (laughs) (laughs) the only way it could be better is if danny's on one side little tom cruise is on the other and she's in the middle with you know holding both their hands (laughs) And here we get the signature shot of the Terminator rising from the flames and the ashes of destruction that once consumed it. Well, here we get Dos Terminators, yeah. the black metallic one, and the El Terminator in the flesh. They don't ever really explain how or why this happens, do they? Nah, it's just what it is. It can just do it. It's like getting a new Transformer or something like, hey, did you know this pops out? Oh, shit, that's awesome. You can put it back together. And sometimes shooting in the face and chest will knock it down for a few minutes. And sometimes it takes it uh, in stride. Uh, yeah, it, it's real loosey-goosey. Danny and Grace have their back to this bridge that they're on. Mm-hmm. The Dos Terminators are coming at her, uh, at both of them. Not good. Before they can terminate Danny. Grace is protecting Danny with her own rebar in her hand. And the tension is mounting. And I like it when Grace says, when they start to kill me, you run. And I was like, shit, maybe we're getting a little tension here. I do like that too. If they had killed Grace at this moment, it's like, fuck, this movie's for real. But before anything cool like that can happen. A hot pink SUV screeches into frame. Yeah, hits the endo El Terminator, knocks it on its ass, and out steps old lady Granny Sarah Connor. Yeah, first off, she looks great. I read that she, you know, quit eating bread and did a million push-up squat things. She She looks fantastic but she seriously is a grandma in this movie yeah she looks like she's about 74 years old but a really good 74 she shoots the exo el terminator off the bridge with a gun dude that has to weigh as much as she does yes this gun is huge it is the kind of weapon that would be exhibit a in a supreme court case to determine if civilians truly need access to this caliber of weaponry for personal protection it is a cannon of a gun the last time you saw a gun like this it was being shot out the window of a las vegas casino too soon yeah probably and then she takes like a shoulder mounted rocket Mm -hmm. and shoots that at the endoskeleton el terminator which blows the fuck out of that thing then she tosses that aside you know for the kids later as they come and then we get one of those real like oh god it's her saying i'll be back but it was at this moment nurse market 25 minutes 15 seconds that i officially told this film to go fuck itself i am divorcing myself from any real critical analysis of this film when she says i'll be back and she just sort of dosy does off down the bridge her delivery of i'll be back that's the best take they had it's real cavalier it's this real i don't give a shit attitude i'll be back see you later yeah it's just like let me go kill me a terminator so she takes off to go check out the exoskeleton what she shot off the bridge and as soon as she leaves grace is like cheese it we got her truck they steal her car and on the way danny is like who is that and grace is like i have no idea who the fuck that old lady is they take off which pisses off sarah connor who comes back up from the bridge just in time to be like, God, sorry, they stole my truck. Then just doesn't bother to check and see if she actually killed the Terminator. Why would you? (laughs) Right. It's only been your lifelong mission. Lo, these many years, as we learn. She is just like, I'm pretty sure they're dead. 
Grace and Danny are driving off and Grace starts sounding like a fish gasp and Grace says, I need water and drugs, some hydrochloroquine or some formula 409, anything that resembles household disinfectant. Maybe just shove a UV light down my throat. Do you have any Trump steaks or Trump water? That's the best kind. Danny says, I want to go see my dad. And Grace says, yeah, about your dad. He's dead. And most of the people in your neighborhood. Definitely your dog. (laughs) And so we see the two Terminators meet back up. How you doing, Sam? How you doing, Ralph? Let's merge together. So they decide, well, Danny and Grace, they've got to stop at an El Farmacia. Mm Mm-hmm which is Spanish for pharmacy, Chad. Indeed. So they pull over and Danny is like, I'm going to go to the police. There's a police car in the distance. And she's like, I'm going to go to the police. And Grace is like, if you do that, you're going to die. She workshops a little material. She says, what do you get if you mix together a hundred cops and a Terminator? A hundred dead cops. Rim shot. I always heard that was a good start. Danny dumps Grace in the back seat and she's like, all right, I'm going to drive you to El Farmacia. And Grace is like, you don't know how to drive. And she's like, I'll figure it out. It ain't that hard. Yeah, right. How hard could it possibly be? I played Forza a million times. They stumble into El Farmacia and Grace, who straight up looks like a strung out drug addict. She's eight and a half feet tall. She weighs maybe 71 pounds. She's shaking. She's sweating. Scars all over. All kinds of scars. And this pharmacist comes out and now he decides that he's going to speak in Spanish, you know, because we're in Mexico. And Grace speaks in English and demands drugs. And so the pharmacist just decides, well, I'll speak in English too. And he asks Grace for her prescription. And so she just pulls out a gun and says, this is my prescription. Come prende. And so she just goes in the back of the pharmacy and she's like a kid in a candy store. She's just raking all manner of drugs into a plastic bag. And then Danny provides a hint of remorse as she stands with the pharmacist. She's like, I'm sorry, Uh, someone's trying to kill us like that's why you're robbing a pharmacy because someone's trying to kill you that doesn't add up it's the look from charles groden as robert de niro goes through his pockets to look for money at the bus station (laughs) you know just like "Mm, this guy grace staggers out from the back and then she collapses in the front lobby and there's a semi-struggle for grace's dropped gun between danny and some old man who looks like he's just hanging around to pick up some hearing aid batteries and then the pharmacist young apprentice comes over and decides to help danny carry this american drug addict out of their establishment because quicker you get her out the quicker things get back to normal this lady's on the sidewalk it ain't the responsibility of anybody in that drugstore as soon as somebody comes close to her is like hey we can help you and get rid of this wacko danny pulls a a gun on him and it's like well i guess in for a penny in for a pound at this point you've already knocked over a pharmacy <laughs> You're just going to Thelma and Louise this all the way to the border, I suppose. They're already past the border. Oh, wait, never mind. Outside, they meet up with Granny Connor, who says, I shave your ass and you steal my truck? Well, ain't that a kick in the keister? Now, you two need my help, but you don't reckon that you know it. I stole this here station wagon, and I'm loading it up with bags of whatnots and doodillies, and it don't make no sense in this movie. But if you and the audience don't ask any question, it won't need to make any sense, because it doesn't resemble anything that's close to a coherent plot when it's all done and done. Also, give me that gun. You're just going to hurt yourself with it. Kapow. Oh, shit. I shot myself in the vagina. Oh, God. Yeah. Granny Connor and Unconscious Grace and Danny, they all climb into this late model station wagon like the one in part two, Bo. Wink, wink. Yeah. And yeah, so they they pile in and Sarah Connor asks who Danny is. Fill the beans, youngin. Who is you and what do you aim to do, young lady? Then she very nicely is like, hey, do you happen to have a phone I can borrow? (laughs) And as soon as Danny hands her the cell phone, she's just like, hey, hey," and tosses it out the window. I like that when she throws it out the window, Danny says, que pasa, abuela? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> this movie plays so fast and loose with Spanish and English that I absolutely adored it, and I hated it. I feel like all the dialogue in this was written by someone who completed two years of high school Spanish. I was very interested to learn whether or not a cat was in the bathroom, or I asked directions to the biblioteca that kind of thing so uh sarah is like well that the phone's how they track you and i ain't ready to kill that thing yet the robots from the future that's how they know where you are and where you're going from your phones yeah yeah i mean when an old lady tells you that robots from the future are tracking you by your cell phone (laughs) 
<laughs> Maybe it's time to call the authorities. So they get to a motel room where they dump ice on Grace. Uh-huh. Danny says, we should have done that in the bathtub. And Granny Connor says, did you look at the bathtub? It's full of suicide victim. There's already a body in there with his <laughs> kidney gone. She's like, hey, uh, give me my phone. And it's in one of those foil potato chip bags. I keep it in a bag of ruffles. That way I can't be tracked by the government. And the tinfoil hat I wear keeps my thoughts free from the aliens. And my <laughs> aluminum foil underwear keeps my shit and piss from rolling down my legs. <laughs> She, Sarah Connor, <laughs> is just starting to shoot up uh, Grace with a bunch of drugs taken from, you know, this sweet, sweet Mexican pharmacia. Danny is like, how, how do you know how much drugs to give her? And she's like, I don't, but I got a pretty good eye for these things. Just think about that. We got a lady who keeps her phone in a bag of potato chips. Who's telling you robots of the future and is sh- just randomly shooting up this other lady with drugs. This sounds like a pretty good time. Yeah, if there weren't the dose terminators this would be a good weekend danny gets all reflective here and she says who's gonna bury my brother and my father and then granny connor says funerals don't help them and goodbyes don't help you young fella and so we get a flashback to grace when she was younger in the future and she's a space marine good god and we see more human skulls and bones and all the robots are in charge it's all a bunch of video game nonsense and then a battle ensues and everybody gets blowed up real good except for grace and her machismo infused commander and then terminators from the future they all look like doc ock with back arms that are flip-flopping around blades piercing and killing everybody and then grace gets stabbed but she goes down fighting the other soldiers drag grace inside the compound and before she can die she tells this medic i need to protect the commander i volunteer make me an augment and then we fade to black and then we fade into grace in surgery and they're putting this blue pointy thingy in her belly and then we fade to black yeah and then we fade back in and granny connor is holding grace at gunpoint in the motel room and granny connor says i reckon you start talking you robotic freak right but grace uses her super speed to snatch the gun out of granny sarah's hand shoves her against the wall points the gun at her head and says you first yeah because she's 90 years old and this other woman is a a human infused with technology and she's all hopped up on prescription painkillers grace does give her the info that she's this enhanced soldier from the year 2042 and then sarah's like you think that's weird i killed a whole <laughs> company thanks to me convincing this black feller to blow himself up grace is like the fuck you skynet what are you talking about you dumb old bitty there ain't no such thing as skynet in the future what Diggity damn, best news I heard all day. Ding, 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 And she says, Skynet sent a whole mess of Terminators back in time, and one got my boy. And so now I hunt Terminators, and I drink. I drink till I black out. When I kill one, I drink till I black out. If I don't kill one, I drink till I black out. I think I'm about to black out. Grace is like, hey, how would you how'd you know that there was going to be an El Terminator on the bridge? And Sarah's like, this interview is over. And then Grace says, uh, I got a few other questions. How do you pay for your weapons? And where do you live? How do you buy food and clothing and shelter? Do you have a job? Did you invest successfully in the stock market and maybe live off dividends? Did you have one of those slip and fall in a Costco where you found an unfortunate puddle of PP like the legendary Lucky from King of the Hill as voiced by Tom Petty? I said this interview view is over speak up next time i'm a little tinnied in this air gonna black out now thunk <laughs> grace is like well i guess she's on the team and outside <laughs> they're like packing up getting ready to take off and outside the motel grace tells sarah privately hey if you get in the way and or compromise this mission in any way i will fuck you up and that's how she puts it i will fuck you up i like that <laughs> I like a character telling this old woman, I'm going to fuck you up, old lady. (laughs) Granny Connor responds and says, well, young Missy, you got your ways and I got mine. And my way says, I'm driving. Let's get in. We're heading to Lollapalooza. And so off they drive. (laughs) Yeah. While they're headed down the road, (laughs) Granny Connor says, well, Miss Gracie, who sent that Terminator from the future? Because if an I don't know who sent it, I can't rightly very well fight it. Now, can I? And then Grace says, you don't fight it. You run from it. You hide from it. You sit on a bench and read a newspaper hiding your face. And when the Terminator runs by, you lower
lower the newspaper to reveal a comical mustache on your face that's the only way you deal with this thing and then grace fills in the stuff we were talking about earlier which is there is no skynet instead there was an ai built for cyber warfare that is called legion that essentially is skynet part two granny sarah's just like i knew it we just can't stop killing ourselves this is one of the dumbest things about this movie to me which is not necessarily that humanity is fated to murder itself through one way or another i'm kind of fine with that and i kind of don't disagree the fact that it's like the terminators came up the same way why wouldn't you make them look totally different right like why do they look the same why do they have the same time time travel technology is that the only way to time travel like it just opens the door to a lot of questions of like well is this some other future and you get into this weird like back to the future space where you're like wait a second so why didn't marty always know he would have memories of the thing Dude, that he was gonna the, do you know what you and then even, you don't even want to start that with me <laughs> Look, you know me. I like a good time travel movie as much as the next guy. More so, I would argue. That first movie, when he's sent back in time, I'm like, no, does not check out. Right. And also, you know what? Avengers Endgame, fuck you too. That was bullshit. When they came in and said, you know how time travel has been explained? Well, it doesn't work like that. It works a different way, but we're not going to explain it. Don't worry about it. We're going to go <laughs> fight bad guys. And you're right. like, all right, whatever. This isn't really time travel. Just, But I kind of prefer that to coming up with a reason that doesn't make sense i almost prefer the you know what don't worry about it we got it covered yeah that's what they did in gold member yeah th fine fine i <laughs> I, th I like that more <laughs> rather than this which is oh no in there's an alternate future just, just that's stop. almost exactly the same <sighs> even though a totally different company is responsible for it, which implies, Chad, that even if you stop Legion, if you if like Terminator 4, Darker Fate... This is why I can't go to Comic-Cons, Bo. I cannot endure these types of conversations. But wait, Chad, if, <laughs> if in the next one they stop Legion and in the same way where they just blow it all up and they kill the guy that was doing all the research and stuff... This is Homer Simpson with a toaster. <laughs> is there going to be a third company that's like, no, no, no... We got this. We we promise you a Terminator-less future. Danny asked Granny Connor, <laughs> how did you know when we were going to be on that bridge? And Granny Connor says, well, young Missy, I get these texts on my jitterbug phone with GPS coordinates and the words for John. So each time I get a text, I pack up my weapons and I travel to the location and I blows myself up a Terminator. Then I pray a little pray for my dead boy. I stop off at the Denny's on the way home and have a Grand Slam breakfast, drink a Dr. Pepper, head back to my motel, and then I drink myself until I black out. Did I mention that that's a hobby of mine? You did mention that. Um... And so Grace immediately is like, give me that phone. And pops the back of it and is starting to interface with it or whatever. What are you doing there, young Missy? Yeah, and she just says, future shit. And I, again, totally fine with that explanation. Don't try to science it up. Just be like, look, I'm not going to sit here and explain to you crazy old lady how i'm interfacing with this phone i'm gonna say future shit and be done with it and then she gets the origin of the text which she's like say that's weird because the same coordinates that these texts are coming from happen to be tattooed right here on my stomach what was done by the commander who told me i didn't need to forget where i was going so she tattooed them on my belly is that more of that shit you make up about a movie or did that really happen in this film no that happened all right i have a question here that says who tattooed this shit on her stomach because it does you know what it she yes is the commander who did it and w once we get to the identity of the commander it's like oh well so she orchestrated all of this from the future which means that no. her memories no. No. she has the memories in the future of what happened to her in the past which means it is a faded situation and it's all predestined and there's no way to stop it anyway she can't have those memories in the future if they never happened in the past. It but then she, she she has to have no. the memories in the past because she is the one who coordinates all this. She is creating her own memory from the future. It, it doesn't work that way, no matter what the Hulk says. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I, Bill and Ted had it the most right. I swear to God of just like, hey, we need to remember in the future to set this thing over here. <laughs> oh, there it is. And by the way, Bill and Ted part three, no one's asking for that. Dude, I, I couldn't be happier. Like, I think the second Bill and Ted is better than the first one. You want to give me another one that is like, hey, this is probably going to be better than most of the shit I see. You know a sequel that's better than the uh, the original and the original is really good? Did you ever see Babe, Pig in the City? I did. That's a fucked up movie. You get that's, to see uh, Mickey Rooney dressed as an old freaky clown dancing around in front of cancer kids. Yeah, no, that is the director of Mad Max Fury Road <laughs> doing a kids movie. And that's all you need to know about Babe, Pig in the City. <laughs> It's fucking great. You're, yes, 100% right. So they decide that they've got to get to Laredo, which are the coordinates on her belly. And Danny says, oh, my uncle is a coyote and he can help us get across the border. <laughs> This is the point where I was like, isn't it quaint now that this movie came out at a time where everyone was real upset about immigrants and stuff? Yeah. That like is all through this movie. But you're like, oh man, that was a simpler time when we were just xenophobic assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Granny Connor says, hey, youngins, we got to get off the grid. We're going to park the family truckster and walk on our feet. They make their way off, and then Grace comes over, and she confronts Granny Connor, and she says, why do you care so much about Danny? And then Granny Connor says, well, because, little filly, when I was younger, I was her, and it sucks to be her target of a Terminator being chased all the time by James Cameron with his long fingers and having him marry you and divorce you because something prettier comes along. And then your career just eclipsed and you're not even known for a larger body of work. Just one or two movies and you can't do anything but take the same damn role again. Decades later, con darn it. You gotta spend the better part of a decade acting a against Ron Perlman dressed like a damn lion. He never used makeup. <laughs> What she really says is like, I was her. This begins where this movie thinks it's a little bit more progressive, where it's like, oh yeah, she's the mother of the future resistance leader like Sarah was. Or this is Sarah, Granny Sarah Connor's belief through the whole movie is that Danny is her. Let me note that all of this exposition happens while they're riding on top of a train that's chug chugging along in Mexico. And this train looks like it's straight out of India. There are people on top, inside, hanging off the ladders in the back as it's rolling along headed towards America? I guess this is a thing in Mexico, maybe? Right, are you trying to sneak in on top of a train? <laughs> well, they're going to wherever her Uncle Coyote is, and then... Uh, Chad, if I may, Coyote. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. The movie then cuts to a data center in Mexico City. We see that there's a couple of dead security guards and El Terminator. Remember him? He's in this movie. Well, he plugs his hands into the mainframe and he downloads the database of some bullshit so that he knows exactly where Danny is. She's on this train. And it's one of those computer enhance, computer enhance, computer enhance. <laughs> Aha. There's the subject and his license plate. Case closed, Sergeant. Like, what are we doing here? Yeah, he does everything but say, enhance. <laughs> And then Cito. So it's nighttime, and our train is rolling along, rolling along, and then Danny asks Grace, so what happens when the robots take over? And Grace says, there's no real warning. Things just get all fucked up at once. And so we get a flashback of Grace as a 10-year-old girl again. Anytime a movie uses flashbacks or flash forwards this much, it, enough. Well, because you're jumping, it's not just like, hey, we're going to go to one point in time. We flash forward to when Grace was a soldier and then flash back from that flash forward to when she was just a little girl, which is still a flash forward. Right. And Grace says, things were really weird. Planes fell out of the sky. Nuclear weapons were launched to contain Legion. But then there was this war and nuclear weapons went off and millions of people had died and food ran out. And then some guys killed my dad over a can of peaches. That's a real line in this movie. And then she goes on and she <laughs> says, Our robot overlord started to hunt survivors. I was scared. And some thugs came up on me. Human thugs. But I survived. I don't want to explain how I survived now. Let me just say that someone helped me. I'm going to call him or her D for short. This person, I'm not going to say if it's a man or a woman, they saved me from these thugs and they raised me into the woman that I am today. But I've said too much already. Just think of them as Danny X. Well, let's call her Daniela because we weren't friends as a viewer have not by this point put it together 
that this is the commander that she speaks of is Danny, then you have literally never seen any sort of narrative film before. The only people who saw this movie are people who have seen multiple Terminator films. Like if you were just watching this film on your own, it would be like watching the fourth Harry Potter film where you're just like, I don't know what the hell's happening here. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have seen it, then you've got to know, Hey, I think I get what the trick of this movie, not even trick. Like the fact that it's a reveal at all seems incredibly wrongheaded to me. Granny Connor gives us the head fake. She's like, let me guess. You're going to be the woman who gives birth to a man and he's going to save the world. I've seen that movie. I've read that script. I've been chased around by Jim Cameron. I know how all this is going to end and it's going to end bad. And she disgustingly says, it's your womb. That's what they want. They want your innards. They want the baby-making machine. Now, mine don't work anymore. I basically, if I push real hard, a little bit of dust pops out. <laughs> and, she, and she says, uh, Granny Sarah says, let somebody else be Mother Mary for a change. And Grace says, My pops ain't worked since the early aughts. Get out of there. I can't have another baby, but I don't mind trying. <laughs> and Grace says, If you're Mother Mary, why do I want to beat the shit out of you? <laughs> Which, again, I relate to. I have a lot of empathy for the character of Grace through much of this film. But then, uh, but then all three of our female heroines, who are surrounded by a whole bunch of other people on the top of this train at night, the three of them, they all look kind of sad, you know? And then we get this real fake green screen shot of the train heading into some other part of. Mexico and then our trio hitch a ride in the back of a pickup truck and they find themselves at the home of uh, Danny's uncle Coyote and here the trio shows up and they go into the house and Grace is just like full on shooting up her stolen pharmaceuticals at the dinner table with a syringe and it, dude this whole scene is on par of watching Eric Stoltz pull out that adrenaline syringe in Pulp Fiction like her uncle is just what the hell are you doing dragging this nine foot tall bag of shakes into my house when danny says like oh she's part machine he's like ah is she and then she for oh. no good reason chad <laughs> just takes a knife off the table a butterfly knife oh yeah of course slices a fly in half in midair and it's one of those green flies that you always find on shit yeah and i guess this convinces the coyote that he's like oh i guess she's a fucking machine well you know egg on my face i saw aliens i know what it's like when somebody has a butterfly knife and they do weird shit with it game over man <laughs> yeah right that ain't funny man they ain't funny at all and they set out for the u.s the rev 9 el terminator uh -huh. has assumed the identity of this border patrol agent lady who goes into a trailer and just murders everyone in there uh -huh. and then eats up all their data yeah and so she spots grace and danny and the gang via this drone that's flying overhead just think about what you're saying and then grace is like shh do you smell something yeah and Sarah goes, I don't hear anything. And Grace says, well, you're not an augmented super soldier from the future, are you? Well, I guess I'm not. I got my hearing aids in, though, and they're turned all the way up to 10. I like the fact that Grace has no time for any of Sarah's shit through the whole movie. No. It's just like, look, I appreciate the fact you're here, but also, P.S., shut the fuck up. Let me do my job. They're headed towards the border with the coyote because he just buys into the whole, my friend's a robot and there's another robot coming to kill me, uncle. And then while they're gone, El Terminator, he sicks a bunch of highly armed battle-ready officers to go out and kill our heroes. And the El Terminator, he says they're part of the Sinaloa cartel, which is a real drug cartel from South America. So... You know, if you're a drug user, addict, or otherwise, you may have ingested product provided by this particular cartel. They do good work. Nobody's arguing that. Our trio makes it to this border wall, and it's a big, beautiful, glorious wall. It's like 30 feet tall, paid for completely by Mexico. There's no way anybody can get over this wall, except that the cousin moves a small piece of wood, and they crawl under a hole that's like four or five feet deep, and they pop up on the other side. <laughs> As you do with any wall that's in your way. You go under it, or you go over it, or you go around it. It's a stupid idea. As soon as as they get through though there was all these border patrol people waiting for them and before they can the border patrol speaks in english Bo. they yell at these immigrants coming over from mexico and yell at them in english get on the ground taco paco well they're on the american side of the border wall 
speak American. Do you understand this? Click, click. Right off the bat, Danny is like, we surrender. We surrender over here. We're good. We're surrendering. Everybody stand down. Give them any guns or food or water bottles you have. I've got a bottle of my pills. They're my nerve pills. I've also got a aluminum foil diaper full of surprises if you want them, boys. <laughs> Grace then tells Sarah, like, hey, if we get separated... Focus, focus, old lady. Huh? If we get separated, yeah. get Danny out of here. Which one's Danny? <laughs> oh, shit. And before they can make a move, here, this is one of those things, like, I don't understand how we get from this scene to the next scene. Because a drone dive bombs them. El Terminator, he's watching them, and he's like, you know what? This might work. What if I crash this drone into him? I'm done. It's Miller time. But as soon as this all explodes... We just kind of cut to, like, Grace pushes Danny out of the way, and then we just go to the detention center where they've all been brought, question mark? Well, yeah, the drone blew up a bunch of the cars, but it didn't kill them. It killed most of the agents, but come on, these guys are professionals. They caught some illegals, they're taking them to the detention center. Uh, this was one of those moments of, like, wait, what happened? It feels like we're missing a scene in between, we blew up a bunch of shit, and now we're just in jail. We cut to the Border Patrol holding pens, and Danny is explaining to this female in intake officer how a robot killed her dad and her brother and this female intake officer for the first time in this movie is having none of this bullshit she's just like yeah all right whatever cuckoo brain i don't give a shit about this none of this is believable and anyone who does believe it deserves to be killed by the robot of which you speak right you can explain this to literally anybody else I just don't care. We cut to Grace and she's laying on this medical table where her wounds from the drone attack are being addressed by medical personnel. And then they see her robot innards and they also find a couple of her loaded syringes hidden in the small of her back or it's like under her bra strap. It, well, first off, it's definitely not under her bra strap. And then a little later, there's a body scan that they do over that shows all kind of like whirly gigs and machinery doodads spinning around inside of her. What is going on here? Even the doctors are like, well, who put this inside her? And and then the Rev-9 shows up at said detention center, which I thought he was there all along, but he wasn't. He was somewhere else. Yeah, he, he rolls up in his pickup truck and he's like, hey, he's like, hey, hombre, I'm here to get somebody. And they're like, oh, come on in, you Texas illegal rounder of uppers. And he just rolls inside, which he has a gun. I'm like, why do you have a gun? Your hands are literally lethal weapons. Just use this to slice and dice everybody as you do. You don't need to carry a firearm. Right. Do you remember when El Terminator goes through this metal detector to get in the detention facility and it goes off because he's, you know, full of metal? And El Terminator says, hey, brother, I've got a titanium hip, you know, two tours in Afghanistan. And the security guard, he says, thank you for your service. And I'm like, stolen valor, stolen valor, Bo. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's a, well, this, this Terminators do a false flag operation, you understand? Yeah. They just let him through. Just like, oh, okay. What well, unit let's... did you serve in? Uh, um... 12? 13? Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. My my cousin was in 13. It, unlucky number, but lucky in love, they said, of that unit. He just strolls through. Then uh, this asshole agent, like an FBI agent or something, shows up and is like, Sarah Connor. Hey, that's me. I'm here to take you to your own private cage. Did you see me on America's Most Wanted? You know, I had my very own special. I'm famous. <laughs> yeah, that's an actual line from the movie. So they have now separated. Like, Grace is in this impromptu surgery room. Sarah is being taken out of the pens where they're holding all the, the refugees. And Danny is there left in these chain link holding cells explaining how robots are coming after her to anyone who will listen which is nobody like you came in with the old crazy lady right this is starting to make a lot of sense to me <laughs> Do you have a bag of ruffles? Put your phone inside it. Yeah, that way they can't track you. Holy shit. Officer, can I be in a different holding pen? You don't have to let me go or anything. <laughs> Just get me away from this weirdo. Alarms start going off. And then at this point, Granny Connor, she uses her super underground militant training strength to beat up her escorts and that FBI agent or whatever that guy was as they're taking her upstairs to the second floor. Back in the medical facility, Grace is going through withdrawals when the medical officers show up to help out. And so she just 
just jumps up and just beats up these doctors. And I think she kills them all. And then she goes over to this one lady and she's going to kill her. She's like, you know, which is the way out of here or something. And she's like, homina, homina. And she's like, you tell me. And she's like, shit, it's that way. Grace steals another man's clothes and off she wanders into the detention facility to find Danny before El Terminator shows up and finds Danny. And then it's at this point that alarms start going off because El Terminator is inside the detention facility. And then Granny Connor, she beats up her escorts and she gets back down on the main floor. And then Grace spots El Terminator marching along looking for Danny. So Grace starts opening up all the doors to all of the holding pins looking for Danny. And then Grace finds Danny and they run off in this sea of detainees headed for sweet, sweet freedom, Bo. In this mass of people, the Rev-9 draws some attention. And so a bunch of cops try to grab him and he does this like porcupine thing Uh where spikes come out of him and he kills them. But like we've talked about before, it's one of those things that feels like it ought to be like gruesome and weighty and visceral. And it's just nothing. Uh -uh. And so they go to the chopper. Yeah, Grace and Danny run outside and they get in a helicopter for their escape. And then Sarah is behind them and is running toward them. Wait for me! Wait for me! But so is El Terminator. Grace is like, fuck that old lady. We gotta bail. No, we don't leave Granny Connor behind. Right, and she jumps out of the helicopter and forces Grace to wait until Sarah arrives and then they jump in the helicopter and start to take off and the El Terminator does this super jump to try to grab the helicopter. But his dumbass has sharp pointy blade hands and they cut right through the landing gear. And all also, Sarah Connor shoots him in the face about eight times as he's jumping. If he turned his pointy blade hands into just fingers, he would have grabbed onto it. Maybe. Not maybe. Stupid, stupid Terminator. Look, he is not the smartest Terminator off the line, I suppose. Grace is like, that was real stupid. And Sarah's like, you know what? She's right. I ain't worth a spit. And tells her like, hey, if you're ever in that situation again, you got, no matter what's happening, you got to save your womb. <laughs> for future use back on the ground el terminator walks over to a couple of texas rangers and he's like hey there boys where can i get myself on a helicopter and they're like well there's one right over there and off he goes right and so our trio of female heroes they're riding around in their helicopter en route to the gps location of the mysterious person that's been sending coordinates to granny connor over the years to kill terminator so the three women land and they make their way to this cabin in the woods and Bo, the door opens up and who comes walking out hello everyone i've been waiting to get back in the movie i hope you missed me yeah like arnold schwarzenegger just rolls back into the movie and immediately sarah connor just pulls a gun on him and she's like you're the one who killed john he's like yeah you got to me and (laughs) and like already he's the hero of this movie in my (laughs) eyes he's like yeah but it's not what you think she says i'm gonna kill that motherfucker right he's like i look i know you're very upset i get it um i'm a terminator it's a really weird time for all of us right now how about you come inside we have a couple of coronas how about you go fuck yourself i'm gonna go over here and sit on a log and think about how many ways i can stick a gun up your asshole and pull the trigger hey, more corona for me that's what i say to that yeah she goes to sulk on the log and tells dan like i used to remember john so well and now he's i don't have a picture or nothing it's a bunch of stuff where like this ought to mean something but it's just we're just grazing over the top of an actual story back inside the cabin old arnold he's cutting up limes for this mexican beer or whatever and it's like what time of day is it like 10 in the morning <laughs> he's like oh it's five o'clock somewhere i expect that type of hospitality at an arizona spider farm but not at a texas <laughs> robot compound bow he says says who gave you that tattoo with my address on it grace says my commander did in this movie making no bones about anything immediately cuts to danny walking into the room (laughs) and you're like i get it i fucking get it you don't have to be coy anymore about any of this old man arnold says please sit down and granny connor says cut the shit you no good rats and frats and so and so who are these pictures of you with some floozy and some kid are they all robots start talking you some bitch yeah he's like Look, this is really weird. I know you're going to have to get your head around it a little bit, but after I killed John Connor, which was one of the happiest days of my life, I got to be honest with you. After that, I didn't have any purpose, and a Terminator needs a purpose. So I ended up finding this lady. Her husband was kind of beating her up. It was a really sad thing, and she had a kid, and so I just took care of her, you know? And then over time, I just 
became, they became family. Her name is Alicia, and this is her son, Mateo. I cared for them, and it gave me purpose. It helped me understand what I'd taken from you, Sarkano. Your son, remember the one I shot in the head, and then I walked over, and I gave him a double tap? And I don't know if you saw this or not, after I threw you around, I picked up the sex on the beach that your boy was drinking, and I drank it, and then I threw it on the ground, too. It was what you call insult on top of injury. <laughs> And, and Sarah just pulls a gun and shoots him a few times in the chest for good measure. And he's just like, oh boy, this is going to be tough to explain to Alicia. This is her favorite shirt. Every time I put it on, she's like, you look so good in this shirt. And now it's got three big holes. Not only that, this is her favorite chest. And I know she's got to ask some questions about all the holes in that. And then his wife shows up and he immediately is like, hang on, let me put on the flannel shirt. It's size extra terminator. <laughs> and honey Alicia, we've got guests. And the wife is like, guest? Who the fuck is at our <laughs> compound in the middle of nowhere? Right. He's like, oh, look, I've got to help with the groceries. If I don't do this, I'm <laughs> never going to hit the end of it. Everybody just enjoy your beers for a second. I'll be back in a minute. We cut to a few minutes later and everybody's sitting outside drinking more beer. And this time, Granny Connor, she takes a beer when it's offered to her by Alicia. Her son is there and the two of them disappear to go make sandwiches inside. And then Granny Connor asks, how does this woman not know you're a robot? You're way plum near 400 pounds do you even have a pecker can you take care of things in the bedroom look you saw the first movie you know i'm hung like a hog that was the one thing going back and watching the first movie it's like man he's got a big dick in this movie you get a pretty good shot of it but here he says you know our relationship it isn't physical she appreciated that i could change diapers efficiently without any complaints i'm a reliable i'm a good listener and i'm extremely funny we don't have sex because I'm a machine. One time I fucked the vacuum cleaner and then got it pregnant and we had the baby Roomba that runs around the house sweeping up. But that's the only time I've ever had any sort of what you would call physical intercourse during my time on this planet. Earth. I think the one gen... There are two laughs in this movie for me. One is him saying in that deadpan Terminator voice, also, I'm extremely funny. I think that's a pretty good gag. Uh, and then the other one comes up here in a minute. But yeah, so he has assumed the the name Carl and he works uh, selling drapes is, is the, the gag. How much would you love to watch a movie that bridges him showing shooting young John Connor in the head to this point in time where he just wanders the earth and he somehow makes his way into creating a small business where he hangs drapes and he marries this woman Alicia with a physically abusive husband and and becomes a father to Mateo and like that is the movie I absolutely want to see I would chip in for that kickstarter that sounds fantastic Yes, that sounds like a great movie. And so they point out like, oh, you grew a conscience. And he was like, yeah, I was, you know, I'm built to have a purpose of some kind. And it turned out my purpose was to get sensitive. Like I cry all the time now. Maybe it's because I'm getting a little older. You can see by the beard. I'm just a regular Joe. They're like, okay, well, we've got to kill this other Terminator. And Sarah Connor is like, I got myself a great idea. We use Danny as bait and we said, ourselves up a good old-fashioned kill box and grace is like what no i'm trying to protect her you crazy old bitch <laughs> old man arnold he's like no this is a good plan terminators follow the mission we should definitely use her as bait there's like 98 percent chance that we will succeed right and they're like well do you have any guns and we get that arnold smile of like oh you know i've got some guns <laughs> And so he has this shed full of weapons. Uh-huh. It looks like ammunition in Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yeah, and they're like, why do you have all this shit? And he goes, I predicted there was a 74% chance that even without Skynet, humanity would descend into barbarism. Also, this is Texas. Gee. Because I follow politics. You've made, I've, briefly, I was a Terminator governor and for a major state. You may not have caught the news about that, but I was. Then I came here to Texas when I met a Alicia and Mateo, we've had a great life together. I watch a lot of Fox News. I watch Tucker Carlson. 
and I watched Sean Hannity. Uh, I'm a big fan of QAnon. I have a <laughs> Pepe the Frog tattoo on my hip. I don't show it off, but at the beach, people ask questions. Uh, you know, I think that name of the show, The Fox and the Friends, I think that's a great name for a show because when I sit down to the, in the morning with my coffee and my eggs and my toast, which I pretend to eat because I don't have the digestive system of a human because I'm a Terminator, but I still feel like I'm having breakfast with friends when I watch The Fox and the Friends. It's a great show. Then there's this dumb scene of Danny learning to shoot. Oh, God. The whole gag here is that she's not very good at it, and Grace is like, no, you need to widen your stance and do this stuff. And Granny Sarah's like, I got an idea. And she just whispers into her ear like, hey, remember when that Terminator killed your brother and your father? Now picture it's that watermelon. And then Danny murders the watermelons. And But then they're like, hey, this isn't going to kill the, the Rev-9, right? And Arnie, Arnie's like... No, this is not going to kill him at all. It, this is all just a lot of wanking that... I mean, I don't do that because of the physical relationship thing, but, I mean, if I did masturbate, this is what it would be like. I got to tell you, that was really how I ended up fucking that vacuum cleaner. I just stuck my giant cock right in the nozzle and turned it off and on and off and on. I called it Pumpy Nyan 2. <laughs> at this point... <laughs> Arnold proposes that the only way that they can kill El Terminator is to use a gun that emits an EMP, electromagnetic pulse. And uh, so they need to get their hands on one of those. And Granny Connor says, hey, I know a guy. And old Arnold says, yeah, that the guy from the Air Force. There, it's 94 miles from here. We should leave now. And Granny Connor says, hey, you've been tracking me, you old Arnold robot. And old Arnold says, you keep your phone in the bag of potato chips. You are a deranged old lady, and you are a danger to yourself and society. Honestly, I'm not going on this mission if she's driving. I'm just going to put that line in the sand right now. Look, I'm a Terminator. I'm practically invulnerable. She shot me in the chest like four times. It did nothing to me. But if she's driving, I could really get hurt. There's still a chance I'm going back to Alicia. I can't go back with half a face because you let this old biddy drive. So he goes to his family, and, and they're like, well, well, what are you going to tell them? And he's like, I told them that the day that I warned would come has come and that my past is caught up with me. And this is the point where Danny is like, well, so do you love them? And he's like, I can't love like a human can, which I thought was an advantage, but it's not. And she gives him this like pat on the shoulder that's like, you'll get him next time, big guy. <laughs> like, you'll learn to love one day. And then he says, I told them that the day I feared would come and it has come. My past is caught up with me. And I won't be back. Boo! Yeah. Here's another question, Chad. He goes into the cabin and puts on this leather jacket uh -huh. and starts eyeing these sunglasses. And it's like, uh -huh. that ain't the right Terminator, man. You ain't Boo! that guy. Boo! Put on the sunglasses. Why are we doing this nostalgic bullshit for a character that didn't do the thing that everybody likes? I really enjoyed the parts where old man Arnold talked about the evolution of him as a Terminator. He describes growing a conscience as much as he is capable of growing a conscience and being able to feel human emotions as much as he can feel human emotions. Yeah. I found that to be a very intriguing idea. Mm -hmm. I get that that's not what most Terminator fans want to go to the movies and see, but I was like, explore that more. Yeah, it is, again, it is the most interesting thing in this movie by far, is this idea that this, you know, Terminator, now without purpose, ends up finding a, a purpose, and as a result of that, of fulfilling that essential need, becomes more human. Right. Forget about all that stuff, because now we've got to go to this burned out old factor waiting for some dude to show up and while we're doing that el terminator shows up at arnold's cabin everybody's gone alicia's gone mateo's gone they're gone it's empty the one thing that the rev nine sees is a picture of the carl's draperies vein that's a clue <laughs> right eddie we can <laughs> we can go after the van now what if it's her brother's van? Like, he has no knowledge that this belongs to old man Arnold. We have no other leads, Eddie. <laughs> 
Arnie and, and company are waiting for this army dude to show up. This is the other genuine laugh of the movie for me. You only like this because it's Schwarzenegger doing what he does best in delivering very humorous lines in a movie. Yeah. It's so out of place for this character <laughs> in this film. Yeah, well, again, we don't know because we don't have enough time with the character to know if this is a thing or not. I would love to see the movie where he becomes <laughs> a drapery specialist. That's what happens in this movie, Bo. A Terminator becomes a professional drapery hanger. A drapist. <laughs> He's telling this story about his work. And he says, yeah, this guy wanted uh, solid colored drapes for a little girl's room. And I said, no, don't do it. You need butterflies. You need polka dots. Like, it's a funny bit. You need balloons. It's <laughs> going to completely disrupt the flow of the whole room. You've got to bring it all together. Yeah, and that, like, that's kind of the... The gig is that his programming in meticulous nature leads him to, like, I know how to really bring a room together with the drapes. Dude, and <laughs> Danny is listening to this story like Bart Simpson listening to Abe Simpson. She is rolling her <laughs> eyes and yeah. looking for anyone nearby to come over and it, like disrupt the conversation. I want so much more of this. I, th that's, as you said, this is what the movie ought to have been. There is um, no way that it ever would have been greenlit if you told someone that the movie is Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator, <laughs> killing John Connor, finding peace and fulfillment as a non-sexual partner to a Hispanic woman and her child. To an abused single mom. And becoming a drapist. If you told me that that was the plot of that film, I would have been there opening night. It is the equivalent of the old gag that you told me once upon a time of the next James Bond movie <laughs> should just be a dude who happened to be named James Bond sitting in a recliner eating frozen dinners and watching porn and jerking off at the end of it and the big climax is he falls asleep i think in that treatment i also threw in that his career was repairing pinball machines yeah or a drapist whatever <laughs> like that is again that that sounds like a like a, a better movie on so many levels and that's not the movie we get because el terminator shows up our military man shows up and gives granny connor a suitcase and he says i don't commit treason for just anybody i'm like how does she know this guy who is he oh it don't matter you can't waltz out of a military base with a weapon like this later on the, yeah like he gets him into a big base <laughs> and it's just like they're with me and nobody asks any questions they're just like all right sergeant stranger uh, wh who the fuck are you who is she who is this guy with the drapes <laughs> grace's spidey senses start tingling and it turns out that el terminator has found them how don't ask and he's flying a helicopter in pursuit of danny i don't know he comes flying in and unbeknownst to the viewing audience el terminator he separates his skin suit from the endoskeleton and then the skin suit jumps out of the helicopter i'm thinking at this point in watching the movie that this aircraft is completely abandoned it's going to explode because i didn't know that he split in two because they never showed that until later when you see the endoskeleton is actually flying the helicopter like hey look at me i can fly a helicopter i can do anything ah. <laughs> i can fly a helicopter eddie <laughs> you can jump out of me the exoskeleton part of him the skin suit yeah is chasing after him on foot the army dude gets shot they take off in the van the drapery van yeah the helicopter gets anchored like that the endoskeleton part is flying it gets anchored by like a tire on a chain or some shit uh, you know it doesn't matter they end up at a military base yes so <laughs> they they end up just rolling up into a C-5, uh -huh. which is like a big military plane, a la like Fast and Furious 6, uh -huh. which I've seen. I know. Then they're like, they ask Grace like, hey, can you fly this C-5? And she's like, yes, assholes. And then runs to the cockpit because she's going to fly. El Terminator has reunited himself and now he's flying onto the base. And then the army dude ends his time in the movie by saying like, I'll do what I can to cover you sarah and you're like i've 
why are you helping her again? None of this has ever been established. You're just some stranger as far as I know. All of this seems to be in support of creating an action centerpiece. And one of the things I read about this movie is that they storyboarded the action sequences before the plot of the film was even finished. Yeah, that makes some sense. What if we put these people on a C5 and we have planes crashing into planes and this is where we just need to get them here so that they can do this stuff. Right. And so Grace is piloting the C5. The Rev-9 It gets his own plane. Uh-huh, sure. Sure, why not? They're chasing each other through the air. El Terminator C5. Crashes into the other one or something. And... It, like it crashes into one plane and then into their C5. Then he jumps onto their plane and then there's some fighting. None of this matters, Bo. No, and the, like the end of it is Arnie just kicks the Rev-9 off of the plane. Yeah, they push a Jeep or a Humvee off and it smacks him off or something like that. And then Granny Sarah Connor is almost like, I ought to let you drop too, you old metal son of a bitch. <laughs> but then she doesn't, and he cr- climbs back up on the on the plane. There's a weird moment where El Terminator, when he falls to Earth, he crashes in the backyard of this family that's having a barbecue and destroys their shed. And he gets up and comes out of the rubble. And as he's walking away, he comically says, sorry about your shed. Why is he cracking jokes? Are Terminators inherently built to be these machines? Machines that have a dry, humorous wit that can't help but eke out in moments of crisis and destruction. You know what? I'll accept it from the old Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator who's been bouncing around for a couple of decades. Yeah, he watched Cheers. Boy, this facial really cracks me up. I mean... They've got a really sly sense of humor that I really enjoy. Also, the dog makes me laugh. (laughs) Yeah, right out of the box, like a fresh off the line Terminator should not be funny. No. It should be a mindless killing machine. The C5 our heroes are in barrels down towards a dam. Right, but we realize that the EMP devices have been shot up. Oh, yeah. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is like, I now predict our chances are 12%, which is much lower than the 94. Danny has another speech about like we don't have to worry about the future we've got to worry about right now this is where we save ourselves over (laughs) over (laughs) did they say it was over (laughs) it just doesn't matter was it over when the germans bump the Royal Harbor? Even if Legion comes down and points to our side of the field. Hell no! Danny. That's what the kids call a mashup, Bo. Yeah, it was a mashup. Th- you take a little from column A, and you put it together with a little of column B. Um, and yet both <laughs> National Lampoon's related, which is interesting. <laughs> this is the point also where Danny is like, wait a second, Grace, I think you know me. And then Grace, surprising nobody in the audience, is like, that's right, you're the one who saved me, Danny. And then we have another pointless flashback or flash forward (laughs) where it's like oh it was danny who shows up when grace is about to get raped in this burned out building or whatever over some peaches Uh uh-huh the littlest rebel shows up chad (laughs) and tells the would-be rapist and or murderers hey you get your damn hands off of her yeah she looks no different than she does in the film like however many years before the war except she's got these really tight braids Uh uh-huh where it's just like hey bow wow wow yippee yo yippee (laughs) the sound of the hks get me through another day hks by the way hunter killers we cut back into the plane where grace says you taught me that there is no fate but what we make you're not the mother of some man who saves the future you are the future old granny sarah is like wait a second she's john that's my boy i thought your face looked familiar (laughs) yeah again this movie acts like this is a big fucking surprise how did you ever think you were gonna put one over on the audience the only person that didn't know that she was the commander Uh uh-huh was sarah connor because she's 98 years old and she doesn't even know who she is (laughs) wait a second who are you again hey there's that terminator what killed my son 
She comes out of the shitter and she's like, I don't want to alarm you, but there's an old witch in the bathroom. Oh, wait, that was me. Long story short, Danny and Sarah are in a Humvee that gets pushed out the back of this C5 while Grace and the Terminator shoot a bunch at El Terminator. How did he get back from the barbecue? Because he had a helicopter at first and then he got a plane and none of it matters. All right. One of the chutes doesn't open, so Grace has to like climb out and fix the parachute on the Humvee that they're all in and then the plane starts crashing and ends up in the water at this dam that we mentioned earlier and Arnold and the endoskeleton are fighting in the water as the plane crashes just get everybody to the dam they tear his arm off and some wreckage falls on Arnold Schwarzenegger and it's like oh he's dead in theory but you're like there's no way that that is the end of Arnold Schwarzenegger no but he's out of the movie for a few minutes, sadly, because he is, again, the best part of this movie. So they all end up in the dam. It is a one-armed Arnold Schwarzenegger after he pulls himself out of the water. There is Grace, who is kind of the worst for wear at this point. Danny and then old Granny Sarah Connor. Arnold shows up and he's like, hey, Grace, it looks like you're jonesing for a fix. I just remembered I found something on the plane. I thought this might help you out. I whipped up some of this in the bathtub. It'll really kick you back. He's He's got a syringe of her go-go juice. This is just something we don't need in this movie. It just doesn't matter. El Terminator, they see in the distance, he spotted them and is now in pursuit. And they go inside the dam, which is naturally a big industrial area like we see at the end of all of these movies where we have to fight in the midst of turbines and molten steel and all kinds of crazy shit. Also a little earlier, Grace drops the bomb. Hey, I just remembered. I've got a secret power source inside my body that can be used to kill El Terminator. How's that for a twist ending? They ask her like, well, how do we get that thing out of you with without killing you? And she's like, you don't. And it's like, ugh, all right, well. So you're saying we need to use your pie hole or your poop chute? Because I'm good either way, sweetheart. Yeah, we're just going to put that little piece of murderous information in her back pocket. So if everything goes wrong, we will rip that shit right out of you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> There's some fighting here. There's a big turbine thing that they shove the Rev-9 model into and it bounces around a little bit. You know, it's one of those things like we think we killed it. We didn't kill it. Now it's back. Grace gets real fucked up. More fighting. Arnold gets real fucked up as well. And you think he's dead. Sarah finally is like hey i hear something i don't think that other bad terminator's dead as we thought he was because that's what's happened the last two times i fought these <laughs> you kill them but they's not really dead you gotta really really kill them and then grace at this point gives danny a knife and is like you gotta cut the power source out of me the, apparently the exoskeleton part of it, it has melted away because of all the turbine stuff i don't know and so only the metal because that's how we end all these there's only the metal endoskeleton so danny is like all right well if i gotta do this i gotta do this and she starts cutting the power core out of grace and then as she's dying grace says i love Ugh. And, and it's like what were, were they were they in love with each other maybe i don't know who cares danny stands up and she's got this power core thing in her back pocket which looks like a giant glowing spark plug and el terminator then just fist fights her some and this is the point where you're like just murder her drive your metal fist into her skull and scoop out her brains you can do that you're a terminator instead it just starts choking her which is stupid because at that point rip out her fucking throat you don't have to choke her like you're trying to get off and you're michael hutchins just <laughs> just rip her eyes out granny connor starts screaming at old man arnold you know good lay about so and so get up and help that girl you busted hunk of junk and it's not until granny connor gives him these words of encouragement that are god damn it carl wake up and he wakes up he's like oh sorry i was sleeping on the job a little bit i'm a little bit older every now and again a catnap just kind of comes he gets up in time to save danny who shoves the power source into el terminator's eye and then arnold grabs him and forces him off the side of the thing onto a thing then they both melt and yeah, and then they both melt into just this horrifying hunk of metal and teeth. Before Arnold totally melts, he says, For John. That's your son. That's the kid that I killed. Don't get that confused with anyone else named John. I know it's a very common name, but I'm saying that this is for John, for your son, who I shot twice in the head before I, I drank his sex on the beach. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know it made a lot of people really happy, but it made you sad. And then over the years, I got sad about it too. Look, I I really got to go. I'm dying as we speak, but I just had to get that off my chest. You know, he's like, ugh, and he's gone. Danny walks over to Grace and is like, you saved me. It's like, bull the shit, Arnold did. But whatever. The movie ends, Chad, at a park as Danny creepily watches a young Grace play. Yep. And now Sarah, oh, Granny Sarah is with Danny. I guess he, she's now going to teach her how to be a sociopath like she is. Uh-huh. And Danny says, I won't let Grace die again for me. And Sarah's like, well then, you're going to need to be ready. So it's time for another Terminator 2, but with Legion instead of Skynet. So a future of killer robots robots is on the way they didn't stop the robot overlords from enslaving us all right but we didn't do that at the end of the first terminator either and this is kind of a weird remake of the first terminator so it just ends with like senorita there's a storm coming i know and that's it which by the way is a fantastic ending in that first movie but what are you gonna do this was not a good movie no it's not a very good movie at all i think that the arnold stuff is fun like I, again i got a couple of laughs out of his character i think it's an interesting character the terminator is worthless in this movie and all the action sequences just don't matter there are no personal stakes or anything it's just mm -hmm. hey we've got to do the thing we've done in a bunch of these other movies again not to go back to the first one uh again and again but you know in that first movie it's just this really tense chase movie where kyle reese gets fucked up and killed and it ends with sarah connor bloody and having to use her wits and she's fucked up she's having to crawl her way through this big machine press and then crushes the terminator even as the metal claw is reaching for it's a great ending to that movie that whole last act of the film is fantastic and even in terminator 2 you know like it's oh, hey we we've not only do we have to stop skynet but also we have to figure out some fucking way to kill this liquid metal terminator and it ends with you know arnold sacrificing himself and understanding like i have to destroy myself too otherwise this horrible future is gonna happen all that stuff matters in those movies this is a movie where nothing matters and I think that the mystery of who's the commander, as you pointed out, is like watching an episode of Scooby-Doo where the gang shows up and the only other character in the show is the sheriff who also owns the local motel. And they're like, well, it's him. It's the mystery Owen wrote in, in Throw Mama from the Train. <laughs> it's like you had, you had two guys and the first guy was killed in the first page. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Owen! That's it. That's Terminator Dark Fate. Which is, is still the best Terminator movie since the second one. Correct. Which is crazy that there are like four other Terminator movies and they're, they're all shit. Which, you know, I was kind of reading up and they were like, well, we blame the fact that nobody went to see this movie on the fact that we had made a bunch of Terminator movies that were god-awful. And then we made one that was slightly okay and nobody went to see it. That's why nobody went to see this movie. Bo? Yeah? Speaking of terrible movies, Ugh. let's talk about the season finale of this particular season's theme, We're All Gonna Die! It's a movie that is a hometown favorite. <laughs> it's definitely a, a pick that Bo is highly opinionated on, and it is the 1998 Michael Bay extravaganza Armageddon. It is probably in my bottom 10 of all movies I've ever seen. I, I, as I, you and I have discussed, I think Armageddon is a movie that should be apologized for on a national level once a year. Do you think every time it airs at the beginning, there should just be an apology? I think Michael Bay should have to come on television every like June 16th and all networks cover it. And he just says, I am sorry for making one of the worst films of all time. This is going to be a good one. I know a lot of people really like Armageddon, and I am the exact opposite of those people. <laughs> so come back in two weeks' time. We promise a good time will be had by all. As always, like, rate, review, um, recommend a friend to give a listen to the episode. If you want to reach us, you can find us on social media. You can email us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from everybody. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Terminator Dark Fate? Nah, it's one of those movies that's incredibly forgettable. I've seen this movie like two or three times at this point, and you ask me any details of this movie in two weeks' time, I will only be able to tell you that Arnold 
Arnold Schwarzenegger was a Terminator that was a drapist. It's better a drapist than not. That You hear that all the time. That's, my mom used to say that to me. Better a drapist than not. We'll see you in two weeks, everybody. Thanks for listening.